Hello everyone, welcome to another episode at the CEO Club today. I'm really excited. I've got an awesome guest, Faisal Acha from LW Group. This is an exclusive episode. Yet again, another exclusive. We keep bringing you exclusive after exclusive. So I'm excited to have Faisal here with me today from LW Group. Faisal, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. I'm really glad to be on CEO Club. I've heard a lot about you from mutual friends, so looking forward to it. Thank you very much for being on the show. This is an exclusive episode. You've not been on a podcast before. It's my first podcast, so it's going to be a tester for me. <laughs> yeah, a test of nerves, it is. Yeah, I love this. I love, I love bringing exclusives on. We're, we're known to try and bring on guests that haven't uh-huh. been on a podcast before. This is what we're about. This is why so many of our listeners tune into our podcast. So talk to me about yourself, Faisal. For people that don't know who you are, introduce yourself. Right, okay. Difficult one because I don't know where to start from. I mean... There's a lot of information in my head. I mean, basically, uh, I'm the founder of LW Group. It's a group of companies I set up uh, many, many moons ago and um, started from the textile industry. We now do medical, we do property development, um, just uh, diversified into different categories of industries. So, yeah. We're going to try and dissect all those different industries as much as we can in our episode. There's only so much we can do. Yeah. So we might have to bring you in for a part two if we don't get through it all. But yeah, so you've got a group of companies. You're in different industries. Yeah. Uh, you've got the clothing brand. What's the clothing brand called? So the clothing brand's called La Wong. La Wong. That's actually uh, my baby company. Okay. So going back um, to when I was in boarding school, um, that's when I started. I got married fairly early. And um, I didn't have any source of income. And I never, ever relied on my father to provide me income. So what I did was um, I had a, an idea. Um, at that time, Arabian clothing was very boring. So you only had al and a duffer. Okay. So I brought in the concept where West meets East. Okay. So different kind of um, thorbs with a bit of spice, basically. Um, and it worked well, so I told my mum to make a few samples for myself, wore it, seen the market for it, and started selling it to fellow students. So that's the baby company? That's the baby company, that's how it started, yeah. So, audience, if you want to hear more about that, keep tuning in. We're going to do what we always do, which is take it right back to the beginning, start it off like a story, and start right back from your childhood. So I want to bring you right back to your childhood, and just talk a little bit about yourself, your upbringing, and what life was like growing up for you. See, I reckon every entrepreneur has a story, has a, has a backline of the reason why they're successful. Now, I'm not blaming on Trump and saying I'm very successful because I reckon there's still milestones um, you know, to be achieved out there. But yes, I do have a story. Um, and my father's Indian, my mom's Burmese. Now, in the Burmese tradition, um, if you've got a little bit of color, then you're kind of classified as a bit of a curse on the family. Okay. Um, so childhood was very, very difficult. Um, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, from the ages of, well, from what I can remember, six, seven, eight years old. Um, no matter what I did, it was always wrong, you know. Um, so if I did something right, it was still wrong. So, yeah, it was very difficult. It's plain and simple. It's due to the colour. And, and that's all it was. Um, I think Burmese people, they put something called Tanaka. Um, so even if they do have a little bit of colour, it makes them look white. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that, that was it. So um, a mosque was incredibly difficult. And I know we talk about mental illness and, you know, uh, depression and all that palaver. It does come into play later on in life. But it all depends on your character, how you are as a person, how strong you are as a person. So, you know, going to the, the local madrasa, I was, I was becoming a hafiz. And you walk into the class and you spat on straight away. You know, you stink by the time you leave. Um, then you start uh, trying and complain to the, the, the principal. But then you get your parents come in. Then they start blaming you again. You know, so it's a never-ending cycle. Uh, so then you think to yourself, how can, I, how can I achieve better? What can I do that's different? So you try and excel in your class. So I was last in my HIVS class and I became first. Um, and, and that took 12 months to achieve. So... Um, I think anyone that's becoming half is out there. Uh, by standard, they probably learn 13 lines. I used to do quarter, um, you know, four or five pages uh, of the Quran, memorizing a day. Um, and then going to high school as well, um, it was very difficult because I was the only Asian. And my parents sent me there because it was away from the Asian community. Okay. So I was the only Asian in a predominantly white school. 
Um, so my first day, you get your head flushed down the toilet. I still remember um, asking uh, one of the students where B block was. And he said to me, he goes, oh, just follow me. And he locked me in the closet. And I was there for about four or five hours. Uh, I came out, I went to B block. I was incredibly late for the lesson. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, and the teacher said to me, um, if you do this again, all right, um, then you're going to have detention after school. Well, it happened again the following day. And when I got the detention, I came home late. When you explain to the parents you come home late because you've been bullied at school, yeah. um, you get beaten up at home. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you're late for hips, you're late for mosque. You know, you, you're now being in trouble with some in high school and you're coming back home late. You know, it's what, what do you do? Um, so that carried on for three years, believe it or not. You know, wow. three years was a long time. So why were they bullying you then? Um, I was the only Asian kid, so I was short. To be honest, I don't think I've even grown since high school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you're short, you're, you're a minority, so you're easily picked upon. You know, it's like, okay, here's the here's doxing kid coming into school, right? Let's take his bag away from him. Um, you know, let's, um, whatever we can do yeah. to create a bit of laughter, you know, um, so that we're the Mr. Cool dudes, aren't we? Um, so that, that, that's, that's what happened awesome. for three years, yeah. And I want to touch upon a few things you've just mentioned there. Yeah. One of them is the, uh, the fair skin and darker skin. That's a top, an interesting topic. It happens in a lot of communities. Yeah. Uh, is that just something that is traditionally within the Burmese culture then? Or what, what would you say is the reasoning behind that? That is a Burmese tradition, but I think it's a lot wider than that. I think racism will never cease to exist. It will always go on. Racism will always go on. I mean, the more you, the more you create exposure about it, I mean, football does it kick out racism and stuff, you'll get more racist people coming on board. Yeah. You know, uh, it's something that will never cease to exist. Talk to me about your own sort of identity then. You're half Burmese and half Indian, did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's that like then? Uh, do you feel like that's a unique mix? I don't think I've met anyone that's half Indian and half Burmese before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, other than the food, the food's great because okay. you get Indian and Burmese. <laughs> um, the best of both. But I, I probably look more Indian than I look Burmese. Yeah. Uh, so what's the difference between the cultures then? Is there any huge differences? Or? Um, yeah, so, so Burma, Myanmar, is, it, it's um, right next door to Bangladesh and you're talking Thailand. Um, so... Cuisine-wise, you're probably talking a lot of Thai food and stuff. And okay. looks-wise, you're probably talking, yeah, Thai, um, okay. as opposed to, you know, Bangladesh. Um, but, yeah, completely different to Indians. Uh, completely yeah. different to Indians. And do you feel like that affected you growing up, then being mixed at all, or did it not have any impact? No, 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 not at all. Um, I think just the fact that I was Indian, because you got to remember, when I went to high school, I was only Indian kid. Yeah. When I was in mosque, um, I was still classified as Indian, okay. but I was a short Indian, and and not only that, at home, I was coloured Indian, so, well, half Burmese, half Indian. Yeah, it, it just all came together. It played a part, you know, combined. It wasn't just that. Okay, these guys Burmese, so let's pick on him because he's Burmese. Yeah, it just generalised. Yeah. Okay, and mom and dad, what were they like? Mom and dad, uh, probably get into trouble for saying this now, <laughs> but. Um, Dad was a, a man of very few words, never okay. spoke. Um, I, I, I think the only thing that I remember, and to be honest with you, I think there's probably a lot of people that can relate as well, because it does happen in this day and age, especially with the Bangladeshi community. The father go out to work all night, yeah. have no social life with the children at all. And this is where children kind of go on towards the wrong path. But again, I think it's on the individual themselves. It really is. Uh, so my dad, uh, man of very few words, my mom probably ruled with an iron fist. Um, we couldn't really do anything wrong, but it was very difficult for me because everything I did was wrong, you know. Okay. Um, and like I said, high school was incredibly difficult, probably a place that I never wanted to go um, because of the bullying factor. And then when you, there's, there's no one to talk to. So when you come home, you can't talk to your dad. Yeah, man of very few words. He doesn't even know what bullying is. And you can't explain that to your mum because she's Burmese, you know. She, she doesn't understand what happens in, you know, high schools. Do you feel like that then shaped the man that you became? 100%, yeah, 100%. And I'm very thankful for my parents for being like that. When you're fed with a, 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 a golden spoon, 
um, you've, you've, you have no ability to work for yourself, right? And you always think that you're superior, right? So when you're in business meetings, you're conducting a business meeting, you feel like you're the superior and you feel like you deserve this. And that will always be your downfall, you know? Oh. So what I do is completely different. I start from the bottom and I work my way towards the top. And that's what I did in high school. So when enough was enough, I thought to myself, look, pardon my French, I can whine like a bitch, or I can do something about it. And that's when I stood up and I said, right, forget the bullying, right? So what if you're bullied? Yeah, no one gives two shits about you, right? So you can either feel sorry for yourself or do something. So that's when I stood up and I thought, right, money is everyone's motivation. It's my motivation. It's what makes the world click. Yeah, it's what makes the world go around. Yeah. And I thought to myself, what can I bring in that I can sell. So there was um, a very famous road in Manchester, Berry Old Road. I caught the bus, I went down, and uh, the little bit of savings that I had, I brought a couple of boxes of shaking key rings, vibrating little key rings. And my target audience were girls, because girls are the biggest spenders. And I started selling on the schoolyard. So the school was selling 10 pence uh, sticky jam donuts. And at the same time, I was selling stuff at two pound fifty. How old were you then at that point? I, I was probably thirteen years old, I okay. reckon. Yeah, yeah. So that's your first taste of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And you started making profit from that. Then how did that go? I had a taste of money, and then I went into telecommunications. In my fourth year, um, I became very popular in high school. Um, I started hiring out limousines every Fridays and picking which children deserve to come with me. I saw and this. Uh, I, I saw this on the uh, one of the news articles I read about you before I came here. So, you used to get a limousine and drive to school and drive back from school more, in a limousine. Mostly, it was from school back home. Okay, school back home. Yeah. So after school, there'd be a limousine waiting for you. You'd yes. booked it. And what was the reason behind that? Just popularity. It was just popularity. It was. Uh, see, I, I was very much into networking then as well. So the more you show up, at, look, you see in social network right now. Um, most of the stuff predominantly is so fake. People yeah. try to create, I mean, you, you probably get it, I get it loads of times. You get people creating uh, Instagram pages or, or profiles and they, they, they make themselves look out to be as if they're really successful. Yeah. Then they try and sell you something. So that is networking. And uh, the more money you show people, the more interested they are. So yeah, at that time it was popularity and it was right, okay, I could probably do a little bit more networking. Now, what I did was, I had a few cousins, um, obviously a lot older than I was. Um, I showed them that I'm making money. I showed them that I'm popular. And I started with the mobile phone uh, trade. So I used to bring in mobile phones uh, from different countries, uh, which phones came out in the market first. Say, for example, iPhones, the new iPhone that was coming out. I used to get it first before anyone else in the country. And um, yeah, that's what I probably spent most of my four feet in high school doing that. Just and how do you get the connections? Just out of curiosity, how do you get the phones before anyone else does? Um, through cousins, okay. and then obviously I then started going direct. How does it go from being bullied in school to being a popular kid in school? Is that because you're making money and now you're becoming more popular? Where's the transition? Yeah, it's always about money. It has to be about money. Um, there are so many people out there that have got money and because of money they've got respect I know you're probably going to get people turning around and saying no, hang on a minute I haven't got money but I've got respect yeah you have got respect because your family upbringing is different to my family upbringing was yeah. uh, your friends are probably different to my friends you know but bottom line is if you had money you'd have a lot more friends that's powerful yeah, yeah so do you feel like when you have money people treat you differently people do treat you differently but at the same time, you've got to be very careful because, I mean, I'm a very trusting person. So what I do is um, there's, there's, there's key rules when it comes to business for me. So transparency, honesty, it's very important. I'm very traditional. So I'll shake someone's hand and that will be the way I conduct business. If I give someone my word, that will be the way I conduct business. That's all gone now. But I'm still very, very traditional. Um, so when so you say all gone, what do you mean? I don't, I don't think it exists much these days. And I, and, and I do feel that the backbone of a successful business right now, it's probably the most difficult, and that is to trust people. Yeah. Yeah. Trust by far is the most difficult thing right now. 
and a social network's got everything to blame for. People, you see it in married couples, you see it in, you see it in, um, in, in, in within Muslim communities. Uh, when I got married, when my dad got married, when my grandfather got married, divorces were unheard of. Right now, it's every week. Your friends got married last week, you just have a divorce this week, you know? And why does that happen? It's because of the peer pressure that social network puts on you. You know, people turn around and say, oh, women, men, they can be, I mean, I'm not categorizing over here. Um, mostly it's, it, it's the female because obviously her friends and stuff will probably turn around and say, well, my husband's going out, we're going to this holiday, he's just bought this car for me, um, we're, you know, spending our weekend doing this, going to this spa retreat, doing this, doing that. So there's a lot of pressure on men now. There's a lot of pressure on men. And that's why I think you'll find it in the Muslim community as well, mental awareness has become a huge thing because it's put men into a corner where they are depressed because they cannot, on a nine to five job, they can't please everything the wife will request. When I got married, when my dad got married, there's only a few things I used to look at. Your faith, your family background. Yeah, money was never a topic, yeah. you know. Obviously, beauty came into it, you know, whether she could, you know, um, child bear, so on, so forth. But now, a man needs to have everything in order. He needs to have a decent car, he needs to provide a decent car for his wife, he needs to have a house, he needs to have a good uh, job. You know, all the Islamic aspect of it has gone out the window. And that's why we find ourselves in the trouble that we are in now. So trust, yeah, so what, what's happened now is because a man is under so much pressure, he's finding ways to make quick money. And there's no way, there's no quick way of making money than to cheat someone. And that's become huge now. Uh, just this year alone, I probably lost circa a million pounds in trust in people. Wow. And that was, that was just to help and support people, yeah. Uh, I've had contractors that come in and said, I need help. I'm talking family friends over here. I need help. So I'd, I'd go on and buy six or seven properties and say, listen, you do these properties up, you keep the profit, I'm only interested in rental income, as long as it gives me 12% plus, blah, blah, blah. You'd go away, do your own business, conduct your own business. Some guy will be sending you, the contractor will be sending you videos of images, uh, videos and images of the property that he's doing, not thinking it's your property, but it'd be someone else's property. And then you come back and you realize that you've just given him 50, 60,000 pounds for a renovation of a job, but he's gone on spending it on two, three holidays. Yeah. And it happens a lot. I spoke to my solicitor, one of the best litigators in the country, and it's on the uprise at the moment. That's just blowing my mind that you've just said you lost a million this year alone. Yeah, yeah just this year alone. Oh, wow. Yeah. And some of the cases, how does that make you feel then when you lose that much money? See, no one really likes losing money, but my intention is right. Yeah, so my intention is always with God, right? So. There's a very famous hadith in the Mala'amalu bin Niyat. All your actions depend on your intentions. If your intentions is right, if I'm helping you and my intention is to help you, right, and that's my sole intention, doesn't matter if I lose that money. See, that million pounds that I've lost, I probably made six, seven million pounds, yeah, on the back of that, okay. right? So my profit on the back of a loss is far greater than my loss itself. And that's because my intention was right. So I'll have a hidden surprise. So say, for example, I turn around and say, Allah Akbar, I've just lost, you know, 50 grand. I'll have another surprise in the pipeline because then a client will order 100 grand worth of stock that I, you know, I, I mean, I've had a franchise open up in Libya last, last week. My team was telling me, I didn't even know about it. <laughs> How do you not I, know? I, honestly, wow. six franchises now in the last two and a half years, three years in Libya, and I didn't even know about it. Uh, no, is that a yeah. big, your business has got to the point where you don't even know? Um, when it I have a team that manages all the franchises as well, you see. Wow. So then I get sent images, congratulations, <laughs> you, you've just opened your new franchise. Wow. And like, when did that happen? That's amazing. Yeah. So you're, you can be hands off as well. They can run everything and yeah. just give you that. Yeah, yeah, here's yeah. a new franchise. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I'm going to dive into that a little bit later on in the podcast. I find that fascinating. Any cases where you can actually remember, I know you just mentioned the builder, but any of the cases you can remember where you've trusted people, given them money, and uh, they've just basically betrayed you. You said you lost a million pound. Any yeah. of the cases that can come to mind? Uh, countless, countless amount of cases. Small startups, um, you know, giving friends uh, some money with business ideas that they've had. Yeah. Um, and, and I've given that in trust. Uh, people have abused that trust. Um, the money never went into a business to begin with. Um, and talking about that, there is something that I do want to do. 
okay. uh, next year and I think it's going to be a community support more than anything and there's going to be benefit financially for myself as well but that's to set up start up funds uh, for young entrepreneurs because there's a lot of people like me yeah. out there who are struggling who are working nine to five but because they've no concept of saving uh, because of the pressure that they are in they need to take their wife out or the girlfriend out whatever it is on Friday night Saturday night or they want to take look you go to shisha bars and stuff uh, you see children uh, you know below the age of 20 yeah. 18 year olds 17 19 year olds and they're spending 60 70 pounds back in my days we never had that so we used to save that amount of money and then put it into an investment and then make your money that way um, I, I, I think you know, UK now, um, for Muslims, we work on maxing out one credit card to the next credit card to the next credit card. We're just digging up a bigger hole. Living paycheck to paycheck. Yes. That is the case. That's interesting you mentioned that. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, business investment uh, a little bit later on. I'm going to try and conclude. Yeah. Once we get the shishas out, we'll conclude. <laughs> so we'll, we'll conclude on that side. So if you're interested, uh, any of our listeners, if you're interested uh, in getting business uh, investment, uh, then uh, keep an eye out. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on in the podcast. So if you want it, keep listening. Uh, that's how you uh, keep them listening in the whole, <laughs> the whole episode, just tease them in. So for yourself, you've, uh, you're now in your teenage years, you've uh, st- started selling, you've had a taste of entrepreneurship. Yeah. How does your business journey then progress? Do you carry on with your education at all? Or? Yeah, so in my uh, last year um, of high school, uh, I probably revised when my GCSEs were coming up, probably did about two to three weeks worth of revision. Uh, but my grades were good. I probably got um, a few A stars. Well, no, uh, a few A's, one A star, and mostly all B's. Wow. Um, so it was good two weeks worth of revision. Uh, my son thought he could do the same, but he ended up getting C's. <laughs> He's uh, not as smart. Yeah. Would you just say you're naturally quite smart then? No, 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 no. no. I, I have a, a, I'm not naturally gifted in terms of intelligence, nowhere near. Okay. Um, I say that to my son as well, because he's a lot more smarter than I am. In fact, both of them are. Um, but I have uh, a tendency to be extremely hardworking. Uh, right. And that's what I think the younger generation do not have. That's my main concern. That's my major concern with my own kids. You know, it's just a lack of drive and the ideology that things are going to be easy. Everything will be okay. It won't be okay. You know, you got to think, you got to think the worst case scenario. Even in business today, I still think the worst case scenario. So, yeah, going back to high school, I got the grades. uh, But again, we still had the problem with he's the bad child. Doesn't matter if he's got the grades. He must have fluked it, paid his head teachers off, whatever. And, um, you know, what do we do with this kid now? So the only option for me was Darul Ulum, boarding school. So boarding school is where you stay overnight, just stay for the whole term? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that an Islamic one? Islamic one, correct. So you go home during, sometimes they allow, to, they allow you to go home during the weekend. I wasn't allowed to go home during the weekend. Um, but you are allowed to go home during Ramadan holidays. Okay. Uh, but then during Ramadan, I was sent to the United States for Tarawi. Yeah. Is that as a pl- on placement? or? Yeah, on placement. It, it was good, to be honest with you. I was led Imam of uh, Selden Mosque in New York. I did a uh, full 20 rakats of Tarawi. Over there. At what age, like 15, 16? Uh, yeah, it day? started 16, but then we used to do it every year. Okay, so built up a few good connects there as well. Again, it all helps because yes. I still use the same connections to do business over there in New York. So being well-traveled and going out to different countries and building those relationships pays yeah. off. Yes. Yeah. So what's that experience like then? So you're in boarding school? Boarding school was behaving? probably more difficult than high school. Okay. Um, I, I just found boarding school... I mean, coming to terms to live with people, um, sharing the same room with, with uh, you know, different people from different countries. You're talking one, one guy's probably from um, Canada, the other guy's from Hong Kong, one guy's from Bangladesh, and you got um, a language issue over there. And then people, st- you know, sharing the same room, cleanliness is a, is a huge factor. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very hygienic, I'm very clean. But then you, 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 you get someone from Dhaka coming and, you know, eating and shitting in the same place. Like, what do you do? You try to explain to the guy 
and then you know you end up having a fight. It's very, 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 very difficult. Um, in my first year, some of the pupils uh, in my room uh, got into some bad habits, but then I got blamed, and then I got blamed, and by standard, I got thrown to Portugal boarding school. Um, I was out in the sticks, and um, out in the sticks, sorry, and you know. I was cleaning toilets in the evenings and just tending to younger pupils and just washing their clothes and doing their dishes for them. Is that a punishment or is that what you actually have to do? Uh, it's just, uh, I don't think it's punishment. It's just something that is given to you. That's your role. That's that's right. what you've got to do. Okay. You know? So you got punished and got sent to Portugal, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Well, why? That sounds like a, uh, a treat more than anything else. How is that a punishment? <laughs> uh, Again, you're going from, it's like, you know, I'm saying to you, why don't you go to Portugal for a year? Yeah. And you're, you're 16, right? Um, you don't know anyone, right? You're now, you've gone from sharing room with people, but it's in your country, it's fine, you know, to go into a, an alien country now. It's even more difficult. You know, we're not talking 25 year olds and you're going on a, um, you know, a, a holiday, a, a, a holiday. You know, this is this is something this is reality for you. This is something. And the food, man, it was disgusting in Portugal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we used to have like rock solid bread and then used to have like a creamy fish uh, that they they make. And it was a, a delicacy over there. But it was, it's horrible. It's not, not not as nice as Burmese or Indian. Yeah, food. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it all comes together, doesn't it? OK, so have you still got any entrepreneurship at this moment in time? Are you still doing anything or is it just boarding school? No, just boarding school. There was no time to do anything. Right. Because you've got to remember, you wake up early in the morning, um, then you, you'll have your breakfast, you go straight into class, um, you just have your break where you go pray your salah. And then after that, once your lessons are finished, you then need to clean the toilets. Uh, once you've finished that, you've got your evening meals and then you've got to wash the dishes and you've got to do your washing and laundry and everything else. And you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for other pupils as well. And, you know, come 10, 11 o'clock, you're shattered. So you just want to get to bed. There's no time to do anything. So what happens from there then? So you spend a few years there. Yeah, I spent two years there and then uh, came back to boarding school in the UK. Um, and um, uh, I, um, I got married. I got married fairly early. Wow, so you had a young marriage. Yeah. How old were you when you got married? 19? I, I was probably 19 touching 20. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a funny story, well, that Well, is. yeah, tell, tell us more about that. I'm sure our listeners are interested. So, it, I, I don't think it happens now, you know. Okay. It, it's a bit like a Craig David seven-day song, <laughs> but it, it happened this way. So, basically, what happened was on um, in the evenings... Um, they allow you to do a bit of academic education now from boarding school. So they right. give you access to go to Preston College. So I was going from Bury to Preston. So they allow you two, three hours to get a bit of education in because you're going to leave boarding school. You need some sort of academic education behind you. Um, so I used to I used to go to Preston College uh, and then there was a, a, a guy there called Rashid and I befriended him because he looked a little bit lost. And I thought to myself, I can maybe guide him because he seems like he's a Muslim but he's not practicing. Um, so I said, Salaamu Alaikum to him, and he didn't even reply to that. I'm thinking to myself, right, something's not right over here. Um, I befriended him, and within a matter of, I think it must have been about four months, um, uh, uh, an oldish fella came to see me in boarding school, and um, he's there hugging everyone and giving salams to everyone. He comes to me, and he goes, you're going to marry my daughter. I'm like, this guy's a loony. Like, I don't even know him from Adam. And... I said to him, I said, sorry, do I know you? He goes to me, I'm Rashid's dad. So I'm like, all right, okay. And um, he goes, you're gonna marry my daughter. I said, A, my parents would never allow it. You're talking hardcore Indian Burmese. That's who you're gonna marry. Um, um, to marry in, um, I mean, my, my wife's probably uh, almost six foot. Um, she, I think she was modeling for Vogue then as well. And Wow. I, at, at that time, I was like, B, she ain't going to marry someone like me. Yeah. I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, like, no, I'm in boarding school, short-ass Indian. Yeah. I ain't got a pot to piss in. Like, what did she see in me? And then he goes to me, goes, let Allah be the judge of that. Everything will be fine. Her dad said that. Yeah, yeah. And then um, on Saturday, he went to see my parents. They were willing on meeting my wife. So my wife came to see my parents on Sunday. Um, I got married following Tuesday. That fast? Yeah, yeah. 
Totally, it's Craig David. Did you meet? Did you meet up with her at all, or where's any? I seen her once, and that was it. <laughs> That's what I said to her. She ain't never gonna marry me. <laughs> oh, where? Yeah. So what? Did you just like meet up, or was it just seeing each other through the phone, or how? How did it work? No, that was it. it, it, it that, we we got married, and my my honeymoon was. I, I got my my father-in-law had an empty house, so he gave me the keys. So the weekend after, um, that was my honeymoon Saturday Sunday. Um, so I I got keys to this terrace house at the back of a council estate and uh, I went there and uh, you know obviously started spending time with my wife and then on a Monday morning my dad knocks on the go door and he goes it's time to go back to school you know back to boarding school and, and that was it. So you got to know her during after you got married basically? Yeah 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 I got given some balloons and a mattress for my wedding gift and, and it wasn't two generations ago <laughs> it was I'm not that old <laughs> <laughs> you're reading your age there uh, you haven't said on camera how old you are are you gonna are you gonna 40, 40? okay yeah, yeah, yeah. that makes sense so wow and just for what was going through your mind then like were you okay to get married did you want to get married or see when you've not had love all your life yeah and you've been bullied and you get your first taste of love yeah that becomes a massive thing and that gives you so much more ammunition you know, it, it gives you so much more drive in life. And yet they're thinking to myself, I was there thinking to myself, I want the best life for my wife. We used to park opposite over here. There's a Morrison's over here. Yeah. I used to have a, a, a little Toyota Yaris and um, uh, me and my wife used to come for a cheap filet fish meal. And that was my classy restaurant. So I used to go there and I used to sit outside with my wife and I used to think, It'd be lovely to have one of these apartments over here. And, um, you know, I've got one of the best penthouses in the whole complex now. It's beautiful. Uh, but that was, that, was a, that was a dream. You know, that was a dream that I had. Um, and this was an excuse. So I brought it because that was a dream, you know. Um, and just for context, it is beautiful. The yeah. views. Or is that a canal that we're looking it, at? It's a marina, yeah. yeah. Marina, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. Uh, beautiful apartment. <laughs> How did you know it was love? You just mentioned like uh, it was love. How did you know if it was love if you didn't know her or did you just have a feel okay. gut feeling or? Yeah, so I think those days are gone now where, uh, you know, a, a guy would come up and uh, see, the thing is we live in a different era now. Yeah, yeah. So even with my own children, they'll probably find someone that they like. Um, so arranged marriage is completely gone. But I reckon arranged marriages work because of one reason, one reason only. Everything was fresh, right? So if I gave a bunch of roses to my wife and a, a box of chocolates, that would be special. If she gave me something back in return, that would be special, yeah? Because it's mutual on both parties. Yeah. But now it's like, well, I've had 10 bunches of roses, roses from, you know, 12 different boyfriends. I've had several girlfriends, you know? And there's always gonna be some sort of comparison, you know? So when I got married, everything was fresh. We built a life together. Now people want a ready-built life and then get married. It's different, you know? And that's where I think the, you, know, you, you solidify your marriage because it's all about building blocks. So when you get married, first you build your foundation, you've just got married. And your, your, your second build is, okay, let's go through pain together, let's go through financial problems together, uh, and let's resolve issues together, you know? And that's what makes you stronger, you know? But sadly, this, that doesn't exist in today's society. Uh, That's really powerful. Blessings open up, you know. Uh, uh, Islam is very simple. You know, we, we get married because we're at an age of getting married. Yeah, we don't get married because we've got money to get married. And then when you have children, the doors will open up. The doors of barakah will open up. Blessings will open up, you know. The, but our ideology is different now. So with the current generation where you see day in, day out where people want the finished product before they've uh, even accept the marriage. So they want a man, like you mentioned earlier on in the podcast, that has the business, the cars, yeah. the house and everything else, and they don't want to build together. What kind of advice would you give to younger people who are experiencing that right now and your belief of sort of working together and building together as opposed to trying to find somebody that's already the finished product? Uh, honestly, it, it, you know, in my family, the, we, we've got two, uh, two different uh, kind of sectors of people. We've got people that are fairly religious, so they, they still go to the boarding school. They still, you know, and the girls are exactly the same as well. So if these two people, like one of my cousins just got married recently, doesn't have a job, yeah? Got married to someone who, again, doesn't have a job. They've, he's just become a Molina, she's just become an Alibaba, but they got married. 
But now you'll see that the opportunities will open up for them. But then I've got other cousins who are hitting the age of 25, 30, uh, but are struggling. They want to get married, but the girl's side is now saying, hang on a minute, your job is not sustainable in terms of uh, giving the best to my daughter. Okay. She wants X, Y, and Z. So lads are getting married a lot later now. You know, and it's not their fault as well at the same time because they've been pushed in a corner where, okay, this is what we want from you. You've got to deliver. And a lot of people sadly can't deliver that. So you'll find it obviously it happens in white communities as well. There'll be, um, you know, just casual relationships. Um, that's obviously happening yeah. in our community now as well. And people will probably tend away not to get married. They probably have, you know, long term relationships, uh, which probably seems like it's going towards that direction. Yeah, I think there are a lot of pressures to try and, yeah, especially in the UK, it's not easy to mm. try and, uh, with the cost of living and everything that's going on, it's not easy to pay the bills and just survive is a challenge these days on achievement, let alone thrive and succeed. Um, so there's some interesting points there. So for yourself, you get married young. How is life like that for you at that moment in time? Very difficult. Life is very difficult. And UK at that time was a country full of opportunities. Uh, I think UK right now, it's, it's economy. I mean, we're, in a, we're in an artificial synthetic um, recession at this moment in time. The rate of inflation, you're, you're probably talking 19%, but then your salary increase is nowhere near compared to the rise of inflation. So people are struggling and people are struggling badly. I've got a, uh, a number of properties and I've seen um, rent go up from four, five hundred, six hundred, fifty, eight hundred, twelve hundred pounds for a normal three bedroom house. I have no idea how people afford that, but it's a system that we're putting in. And the reason why that's happening is because A, um, the, you, you, as I mentioned, the salaries haven't gone up. People aren't saving. They can't afford mortgages. Um, back in the Asian community, your dad used to buy you a house and then used to pay him back or used to go to family members, you know, so that they could lend you a little bit of money. Collectively, you got enough for a house. That doesn't happen anymore. No one's got savings now, right? So what do we do? So Asians in the last four or five years have started getting mortgages. Yeah, we're going to come and talk about the halal and haram aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. there are loopholes and you can get Sharia compliance mortgages as well. Go ahead and do that. And it's a more expensive option, so I'm probably not in favour of that either. But what's happening now is people don't have savings to afford a mortgage, afford a mortgage, right? So they're renting. And the rent's that expensive. Honestly, I, I, I find it very, very... I'm, I'm concerned about my own children over here as well. I mean, I say my own children. I'm talking my own blood children. But I'm also concerned about people in the community. I see young people out there and I'm thinking, what is the future for them? There is no future for them. What do they do? They, they either get into business or it's going to be a job for them. And job for me is exactly what it is, just over broke. You're always going to have your head above the surface and that's all it is. What, what would you say the answer is to that then? How can you get out of that rat race kind of situation where you're just paying the bills every month and just surviving? Right. Hard work, right, and always look for a niche in the market. Yeah, always look for a niche in the market because there will be gaps there. There will be opportunities where you turn around and say, do you know what? That's not been done, right? So let me try that. But then again, the problem is the funding. And that's why we'll probably chat about yeah. it later on. So, you know, yeah. keep tuned. Keep, keep uh, tuned for that. And, and, and this is where it happens. And that's why I feel like if you give a child who's hardworking the opportunity, he will be successful. But honestly speaking, I think the generation's damn lazy and I think they don't want to do that. Most of the people spend their time on the mobile phones. Yeah, everybody's looking for quick cash, easy Everyone. options. Yeah. Um, so for yourself, you get married. Uh, when does the business come into it? Then at that age that you mentioned when you got married, it then motivated you to want to give the best to your wife and your future children. So did that give you a sort of kick to try and succeed and become successful? Yeah. So. I, I used to live with my parents, and um, what happened was um, my father to turned around and said, I will be retiring, so you are going to be the breadwinner of the family. And I thought to myself, I could hardly put a meal on the table um, if I become a local imam, because that was the only 
real option that I had. I'll probably be living on benefits, but how can I, how can I support my parents, support my wife, and if I have children, you know, what's going to happen? I started working at uh, Littlewoods call centre in the evenings just so that I could afford a little bit of pocket money uh, to provide my wife. And you know the thing is, and I, again it comes from being a supportive partner, my wife is not materialistic at all. In fact, I brought her a Lamborghini Huracan, never wants to sit in it. Um, an M50 doesn't want to sit in it. And I said to her, I said, what car do you want? And she goes, one of those, and it was a Ford S Max. Right, oh, wow. even at this, even at this stage, you know, uh, she just doesn't find it anything interesting. Yeah, but that doesn't. that that gives the partner the extra cash, so he can use that into an investment, you know. Wow. And because my wife wasn't materialistic at all, it gave me enough money to buy fabric, then give that fabric to my mum, and then for her to make samples of clothing, which I started selling. In boarding school which gave me a little bit more income yeah and then I wanted to scale that up so what I did was straight after boarding school I thought right okay I got a job at DWP um, six months I couldn't find a job anywhere in fact to be honest I tried incredibly hard I was speaking to my son football uh, on Tuesday night as well I said I worked with him for a little while I worked with him for him but I couldn't retain a job because there was nothing out there with the degree that I had it was um, a BA in Islamic theology, and that was it. No one was ready to give me a job. I went to Vodafone, not too far from here. They said, I couldn't talk for shit. You know, my presentation was shy. You know, yeah. you, 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 you couldn't retain any customers on the phone. So they let me down. So I think Allah had guided me into, your only option is business. I booked myself a flight to China. No Alibaba, no AliExpress. So you gotta find yourself a factory. I went to about 12 different factories and every one of them turned their backs and said, well, you want 100 pieces of clothing, six sizes, right? And you want three designs. That's like, you know, three, four pieces, whatever it is. So we ain't never going to do that for you. We're talking like volumes. Um, so just to stop you there, was this for the clothing brand? Clothing brand. And where did the passion come from or where did the idea come from for the clothing brand? See, I... I, I um, I, when I mentioned to you in boarding school, yeah. I, I created a concept and that concept worked so I knew I could scale that up. Right. So that's where the idea came from. Okay. The business drive was always with me and I got pushed into corner because I never got a support from my family. That makes sense. So it's responsibility. And that's where I, when we talk about the younger generation, they don't have responsibility. Yeah, the, when we opened the fridge, I was talking to a friend of mine. You open the fridge, you got food spilling out, but kids don't want to eat now because it's spoiled for choice, you know. But when you when you push someone in the corner, um, and and they've got that drive and and they've got the the expertise. Uh, when I talk about expertise, I'm talking personal expertise. Um, they will make do with that situation, and they will be successful. That makes sense. Um, so just to explain the concept for context for our listeners, yeah, yeah. what is the concept? What is the clothing? Right, okay. So uh, the Arabian brand is called Lawong, L-A-W-U-N-G. Lawong. Yeah, and I've got a secondary sister company called Alamir. Um, right now we have around 300 plus distributors. We've got in the Middle East 127 franchises. And um, it's um probably the largest it is it's not probably it is the largest independent arabian attire company in the world um and the reason why we're winning product because i'm still thinking differently and how i can change that product and make it different make it unique um so say for example you're wearing the blazer and the shirt i'll incorporate that onto a thorb and make it look you know um like the biz you you, yeah. you could wear it to a formal I, I, we've had so many people that have had no option uh, at work work placement so they've had to wear the traditional Arabian clothing um, and they get mocked and the managers turn around and say I'm sorry guy you know you can't really wear that you know it's just a long dress so now we've created a corporate concept and we say right okay why don't you wear that managers got no nothing else to say you can't say anything so you're innovators in uh, Arabian clothing. Yeah, yeah. So that's the concept. Now let's go back. Yeah. Book a flight to China. Yep. Talk to me about that. Went straight to Guangzhou, uh, which was the capital of the textile uh, industry. 
and I visit 12 different factories. Each factory let me down. Uh, the quantity was just not there. So I then have a bit of a dilemma and the dilemma is I'm going back home and I'm going back home at a failure. I had the concept, I've got the drive, but no one wants to supply me. So what do I do now? So I'm sat in a taxi on my way back to the airport and I get a phone call from the guy that I met last. And um, he said to me, he goes, come back and see me. And I said to him, if I come back and see you, I'm losing my flight. And I don't know how I can afford to get back home. So he goes to me, he goes, look, it's your choice. If you want, I'm open for the conversation. I spoke to the taxi driver. I said, what do you think I should do? All right. And there's me drawing pictures because they don't speak English. I'm like, what shall I do? Shall I go back? Shall I do this? You know? And he said, you, you do a picture of a heart. He goes, do what your heart. Basically, he was telling me, do what your heart is telling you to do. And I thought, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to go home a failure anyway. All right. I'll, I'll find my way out of this place, even if this guy's not going to entertain me. Yeah. I went back. Fast forward, fast forward, the same guy whose factory it was, I own that factory. No. He still works for me. He's my general manager, right? And his whole family works for me. And I have oh, wow. 700 people over there that work for me, yeah. 700 people in that factory? Six, uh, yeah, 600 of them are tailors, yeah. And you bought that factory? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when you went there, did he allow the minimum order quantity or how did it work? Yeah, so originally we worked together. Right. Then I bought him out. But... When we talk about trust, he's the most trusted person that I know on planet Earth. Not a Muslim. Yeah, I've had people from this local community, I help a lot of people. I've had people go over there to China and they try to steal my team and I'm just helping them, right? So say for example, someone wants to go over there because they want office furniture. Um, my manager will call me and say, he's trying to recruit me now, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I'd have a couple of million pounds sitting in his personal account and Every penny is accounted for. This, 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 is, this is things that we can't get within our own Muslim brotherhood. Is that trust? Is that trust? What do you think the Chinese, is it in, within them or is it just finding the right person then? Or would you get lucky with the right person? I think I got lucky with the right person, but I think as far as etiquette is involved, yeah. Chinese are advanced. And I've always said that. They're the innovators of the world. I mean, let's talk about the Chinese for a little while, yeah? yeah. Let's talk about um, where the Chinese were 15 years ago, where the cars were 15 years ago. Uh, you had Top Gear absolutely harassing them with the kind of crap that they were coming out with. They were making copied products, but they weren't fabricating it. They were studying. That's what they were doing. That's what the Chinese were doing. They were studying clothing. They were studying... Um, technology, they were studying how to build railway lines. They called German engineers down to build one line and they fabricated that, built it better, reverse engineering. They're the best, in terms of hardworking people, I've never met anyone like the Chinese. They send the people, and this is, this, is, this is a problem with the younger generation now. You go to high school, yeah, as a father you stand outside, yeah, you see you know, 14 year olds with vapes, because our government is allowing that, you know, it's allowing it. It's very easily, easily stoppable, but they don't stop it. You know, you get 14 year olds, you know, hurling abuse at teachers. Where's the respect? Where's the discipline? You know, they come home. Um, um, Simon, can you come down for me? No, no, fuck off. You know, I've got things to do. I've got my friend who's calling me. Where are you going? Slams the door, goes. No etiquettes. I see it day in, day out with children. You know, I, I, because I get called into people's houses as well. You know, I've got a problem with my child. He's on his iPad at two o'clock in the morning. Well, what are you doing providing your child an iPad at two o'clock in the morning? Why do you need to, I oh, can't, he shouts at me. You know, this, this is who we're dealing with now. You know, this, this, this is a younger generation that we're dealing with now. Dad, you can't take away my freedom. You know, I can have an iPad. I can, you know, I'm 14 year old. Uh, or even at the age of 16, I'm 16. I can do whatever the hell I want now. You know, this is the attitude that young people have got. And I do go and I, I, I do help, you know, the, the, uh, we've got this uh, organisation called Youth in Action. I do tend to speak to youngsters and stuff because they look, they look up to me because they think, OK, this guy, he's an alim, he's a Maulana and he's also a businessman. Yeah, so he's got a bit of swag. So let me see what he says. You know, let me take a bit of information on what he's telling me. So they do listen to me. But then if you're just a person who's had experience, 
but not successful, but he still had experience and you try and teach this child, he won't listen to you. You know, no. because the youth of today, the idols, right? Look, I go to cousin's house, right? And you see misfit boxing. So I, I had a company called Celeb and Me. Um, misfit boxing was my idea. Yeah, if you do your research, there's a company wow. called Celeb MMA that I started up probably about two years ago. We tried to get the BBC to commission it, but it didn't happen. And that's the only reason why I resigned as a director from that company. But we had Andrea Bunker, that's on Misfit Boxing right now. We had Tasha, who's on Misfit Boxing right now. I had it two years ago. Yeah, there's Callum Alexander, I had on my um, uh, platform, Celeb MMA, who's on Misfit Boxing right now. You know, um, so Dapper is on Misfit Boxing right now. Yeah. You know, that's another one, Dapper Last. He was actually partner of Celeb MMA. But my concept was MMA, they're doing boxing. And I, and I still reckon MMA would be a lot better than boxing because celebrities can't box, but yeah, they'll have a scrap in a cage. It's a lot more entertaining. Yeah, what Saudi did, opening ceremony, that was my idea. Because I had um, uh, 20 seconds, what's the name of the uh, Lisa Mafia? What's the name of the... Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, there, there's, uh, it's, it goes back a little bit. So solid crew. Oh yeah, yeah. But, they um, were contracted to do the entertainment. Um, so I had all that in place. We just tried to get the BBC to commission it. That was my idea. With the commission it, I could I could create a platform around mental health wow. and all of that. So it was good. I I spent probably half a million pounds on it. Oh, uh, did you yeah, make yeah, a profit yeah. on it then? Or no, no, what? no, no. Some businesses you, you you take a risk and you lose. Some yeah. businesses you break even. Some businesses you, you you make a loss. But it's all right, you know. It's fine because you go into business with, with, the, with the idea that it might be a profit, it might be a loss. Yeah. If it's a loss, it's fine, as long as you, 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 know, you can sustain that loss. So you meet up with this Chinese connect. I'm going to call him the Chinese connect. Or has he got a name? <laughs> Hua Ping. Hua Ping. Yeah, yeah. Hua Ping, okay. Yeah. If Hua Ping is watching, yeah. we'll get you on the podcast at some point, Hua <laughs> Ping. Uh, so he's the Chinese connect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll stick to Chinese connect. That yeah. sounds a little bit easier to say. So you've built a relationship up with him. Yeah. You've now got the link. You come back home. You're 19, 20 right now, or 20. you're a little bit older? Okay, you're yeah, 20 years old, you yeah. come back home, you've got a Chinese link, you've got a concept. What happens now then? So, to scale up, you need money. I then uh, revisit my uncles, but then my parents actually do support me. And they turn around and say, right, okay, we'll support you, we'll fund whatever you want to fund, uh, whatever business that needs funding. Wow. Um, so, alhamdulillah, they came. Um, Is know, that because to, you convinced them, or? I, I, I think they saw that, there's there's an avenue that this could be successful right yeah and i think at the end of the day parents will always be parents you know um they'll always have a moment in their life where they feel like if i'm not going to support this child of mine there's no one else out there for him talk to me about lawong then how does it grow into the brand that it's become okay so from lawong um, i thought to myself and i looked at my father so what he did was what he did wrong was he didn't diversify in business and um, he even tells me today uh, he said if if you were around the time that i was doing business you would have scaled that business up to a, a degree that I, I i couldn't have even imagined okay. um, and because i was the first person in the family to do import export um, my uncles were buying ready-made stock. I was manufacturing stock. You know, there's a massive difference over here. Um, so what I did was um, I seen how each one of my uncles were very successful because you learn from others. That's what you do in life. Yeah, you learn from others. So you learn of first, how is that person successful? Let me be successful, as successful as him, if not more. You never know with business. One day it'd be good. The next day, yeah, you'll have a decline because the business is never on an incline, yeah? You'll have your stable moments and then you'll have your decline unless you've got the power to diversify. So if you diversify, you'll always have other businesses, yeah? So I thought to myself, right, okay, first things first, I'm not looking at a, I'm looking at a very small market over here. Right. United Kingdom, there's a whole world, right? So what do I need to do? I need to start export. So that's what I started first. When I started export, that's when I started building my connections. So then I started supplying state school 
uh, in mostly in African continents with government uniforms. And then I got contract with military NATO with outerwear, sleeping bags, socks, um, so on and so forth. And they were big contracts, 100,000 units. And then I started supplying the Arcadia Group, top man, new look, river item. But I thought that was mostly penny profits. And I thought, if they can do that, then why can't I build a brand of my own? So then I built a, a company called Wilfred Egbert. Um, I went to the United States on a road trip with friends and um, I, I seen that the Americans had no fashion sense, man. It was just tank tops and shorts and that was it. So when I wore what I wore, um, we went to different like uh, events as well. Um, and I was in VIP lounges um, and there was, uh, uh, at that time, Kanye West was fairly young. So he came up to me and goes, hey man, he goes, I like what you're wearing. And I still remember it was a white kind of uh, fully flowery embroidery shirt. And people were looking at me thinking, either this guy's on the wrong bus or he's got good fashion sense, you know. Um, so he came up to me and he said to me, he goes, he goes, I like what you're wearing. And um, he goes, I want you to design something for me. Wow. And that's what I did the day after. Um, um, I did the same thing for Eddie Murphy and Shane Ward. Um, happened during the time I was in the United States within a matter of two weeks you know so you're designing for Kanye West uh, Eddie yeah. Murphy like all how yeah. are you meeting these celebrities it was in it was in places where you had just VIP so I had access to VIP lounges and you had se separate sections you see so when I was sat there they just seen that I was wearing something different something unique you got to understand you know it was it was all about baseball caps tank tops and shorts right so they hadn't seen anything different you know, if you're going to compare it now to what it was then, it's, it's a massive difference. You know, this was before Top Man came in to the United States or Zara or H&M. You know, this was well before all of that. Um, so then that, when, I, when I seen the gap in the market, I created a brand called uh, Wilfred Egbert. And um, um, Macy's and Bloomingdale's um, caught the eye and they said, we want to buy into your product. Uh, I was at a show called Magic Show in Las Vegas. Uh, one of the representatives came up and said, we really like your product and we want it in our stores. But they ended up buying the the brand itself, but okay. completely ruined it, turned it into a Kenneth Cole, proper traditional American, you know, uh, striped shirts and all that crap. It was rubbish. Um, but this was before Zara came in. So Wilfred Egbert was a premium Zara. It was different, honestly. It was really, I mean, it, um, it's a bit of a shame really I got a good payout but I should have kept up with the brand actually because it was a fantastic brand yeah I think there's room for a brand like that even in the market today yeah there's always room for brands like that so a couple of questions for you how do you start selling the products when you've got the manufacturer and the Chinese link sorted to then building the brand how are you selling the products in the uk and how are you building your brand at the beginning like a lot of our listeners will start a clothing brand and they'll struggle with sales they'll order 100 units and they won't you know they won't be able to sell any of them so f i know the question is going to get asked how are you building and what where are you getting these sales from okay so very easy to answer that um it's all about your product yeah it's all about your product if it's not a niche product, if it's not different, forget it, don't do it, don't even bother with it. You're gonna spend money and all you're gonna do is compete against other people. Yeah. That's all you're gonna do, yeah? So you gotta, you gotta be smart, you gotta work your way away from the competitors because you need a product that you're not competing with other people. It's simple, you know? So if, now I've got this Arabian product, I had no competitors, that's zero competitors. So I had one exhibition and 30 retailers would come and say, I want that product. I haven't got a product like that in my shop, you know? And then when I take that product overseas, and there used to be a, an exhibition in France, a lot of the international clients used to come, it used to, call, it used to be called Le Bourget. I think they still do it. Okay. And I remember um, on the first day, we turned over 140,000 euros. Wow. Yeah, this is just individuals buying your product, right? Individuals. Individuals buying your product. And, and then what happened was the individuals would wear it They'd wear it outside and then they'd take it to a shop and turn around and say, well, have you got another one of these? And they'd turn around and say, well, what is that brand? Oh, it's Alamir. Well, hang on, where's Alamir? Oh, it's bus based in London. Then they'd contact us and then all of a sudden you're supplying the whole of France. You know, you get wow. people from Germany, you're supplying the whole of Germany. 
uh, Australia, even Nigeria. I had, I had one client, uh, I've still got one client, Abdul Hamid Aditona, his name is, and uh, he was chasing me for three years. And when you, when you think about um, Nigeria automatically, you know, when we spoke about colors black, yeah. yeah you think about nigeria and you think scams Scamise, yeah. yeah and this guy was after me for three years and i'm thinking to myself nah the team's telling me he's ringing up seven times a day i then answer his phone call and i say you've been calling us for the last three years is there something <laughs> i can help you with and he goes, turns around and he goes give me a chance you know and i said to him i said you do know nigeria is full of scammers yeah, yeah. and he goes to me because not everyone in the world is a bad person i gave him a chance and He's one of my best clients now. No yeah, way. He's the guy that got the contract for the government schools. Wow, yeah, so yeah, he just yeah. goes to show. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's actually a Nigerian delegate now. I mean, absolutely brilliant contact. Uh, I've got a few emails of, uh, of those Nigerian <laughs> delegates don't emailing do me. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, you know, I might be missing out on something. I'm going to go look through the inbox and uh, see, because sure, I'm sure I saw one and it said you've got 100, we're trying to get 100 million pounds worth of gold out of the country. And, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's definitely a scam, bro. <laughs> In the early days of you building up the brand, I can see that you were quite proactive going to these trunk events yeah. and networking events and these days when I speak to entrepreneurs, a lot of them, they want the sales to come to them yeah. and they want, they're want more reactive. Yeah. Uh, is that from your experience the case? You need to go out and push your brand to yeah, people yeah. And, yeah. and go I, out and meet I, people? I, I think in this, in this day and age, the world is a very, very small place. So it's all about social network. Yeah. So if you've got a clothing brand and you want to pursue the line of clothing, yeah. you need to get celebrity endorsements. Boo have done it perfectly well. Yeah, Boo here pretty little thing that's what they've done it's all about celebrity endorsements if you can get the celebrity endorsements you've got the exposure so say for example you've got a budget of fifty thousand pounds yeah um take twenty thousand pounds away spend thirty thousand pounds on your clothing yeah manufacturing uh, sorry thirty thousand pounds manufacturing if, that, if that's what i said use the twenty thousand on your marketing get influencers six or seven of them right to create the exposure behind your brand that's all you have to do. That's how you're going to get your sales. Because without celebrity endorsements, without influencers being involved, if it's clothing that you want to get into, you ain't never going to succeed. There's a hundred million different brands out there. I mean, how are you going to compete with them? You can buy, you know, stuff on AliExpress for a quid, for two pounds. How are you going to compete, you know, if you're a nobody? So what makes you a somebody is your brand. You know, that's what makes you somebody. Creating that brand. Creating the brand, yeah. So you build this company. Do you then? Fr you mentioned slightly earlier on the podcast that you've got 120. Is it 127? 127 franchises. franchises. 127 yeah, yeah, franchises. Yeah, yeah. So how does it go from you selling those uh, clothing's to then franchising out and building that whole model? Right. So uh, when we went into the Middle East, um, uh, and uh, this is a story as well. So I, I met up with a guy called Faisal Al Jadeh and uh, he's the owner of a company called NESK, N-E-S-K, the NESK group, massive group. They've probably got about 170 different franchises in different sectors. And uh, I meet him in uh, Jumeirah, Jumeirah Hotel, I don't know which one, which one was it, the one with the wave, yeah. uh, Jumeirah, Jumeirah Beach Hotel. Yeah. And um, uh, we were in the uh, meeting room and I was the first person there with, before I had a representative, um, Mr. Balbaki. He's the guy that you know connected the dots. So when I was in the meeting room, um, he came in and he goes, he goes, oi, oi. he goes, uh, make me some tea. So I'm thinking, right, this guy thinks I'm a tea boy, because <laughs> again, you know, I, I, you know, it's it's the thinking of an of an Arab, a short Indian guy. Yeah. What's he doing in this meeting room? I'm meeting Mr. Babak, and he's bringing an English guy to meet up with me regarding this clothing brand. So um, I make him some tea, and I'm like, um, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name. He goes, uh, it's uh, Mr. Al Jadai. So I said, would you like some biscuits with that? You know, is there anything else you would like? He goes, no, 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 that's best class. And then uh, I waited near the door, you know, deliberately. I just stood near the door like a waiter. And um, I waited for Mr. Babaki to walk in. And he walked in. He goes, oh, mashallah. He goes, you've met Mr. Faisal. Uh, Faisal, this is Mr. Faisal. And he stood up thinking, what the hell? <laughs> All right. So I said, that was a good tea, wasn't it, that I saved? Um, but, yeah, we, 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 you know, we, we did business and we still do wow. business. 
So yeah. are they the ones that deal with all the franchises? No, then no, no. We've got a number of different businesses that we work with. Okay, so uh, he took one franchise basically. Or uh, what he took a number of franchises. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you just built the company. Yeah, it's like it's like. Do you know everything is based on trust? I had a guy that was ringing us up. Uh, he, he's probably going to look into this podcast. He's always following me on social network and stuff right. as well. And he rang me up and uh, he goes to me. He goes, "I want to open a distribution network in Algeria," and I said to him, um, "Let's, you know, let's chat or continue with this conversation at a later date." He's seen that I was in China, and he goes, "Can I come down and see you?" So I said, you want to fly down all the way from Algeria to China to come down and see me? He goes, yes. So I said, is it just yourself? He goes, no. So I told my manager, I said, just uh, accommodate for three people. They're going to come down from Algeria. Before he came, he put a quarter of a million pound in my bank account. Oh, he transferred it? He transferred it. He goes, this is a deposit. I want to talk business. Yeah. Wow. Now, go back to what I was saying to you before. Trust. That is Amana. Yeah. Now he's put money in the account. I'm thinking this guy wants to do business. We talk business now. He come and um, he's now, he's opened the first franchise in Algeria. This is less than a year. He came in March. I think it was, yeah, March. Um, and uh, he's on the uh, road of opening 50 distribution centers in Algeria. Um, but we'll go back to the trust issue. This guy's put a quarter of a million pounds in my bank account. Yeah? Wow. I, I could have disappeared, yeah? I mean, it's not going to get me anywhere. I caught a million pounds, is it? But people's thinking is exactly that. Yeah. How many holidays can I go with a quarter of a million pounds? What car can I buy? What can I show off with? How many restaurants can I go to? You know? I had a, I had a friend come see me in Dubai, and uh, I was at the... Um, uh, what was it called now? I, I stay at different hotels. I never st tend to stick to one. SLS, SLS. It was a new residence I opened up over there. Business pay. Because I was doing business around that area. So I'm thinking to myself, I'll stay around that area. I had a friend come and he goes, he goes wow, he goes, freaking hell, duplex apartment and that. He goes, but yeah, you're doing it. And I said to him, I said, let me guess where you're staying. He goes, go on, he goes, on the seam. So he goes, how the hell did you guess on the seam? So I said, because you want to be that somebody that your missus said, this person has gone to al -Nassim. we need to go to al as well. You're just a puppet, that's all you are. And this is where people are going wrong because they're going to the same damn hotels, same damn restaurants, same damn posts on Instagram. Like, I don't get it when people post food on Instagram, like, okay, you're, you're posting a story that you're eating this. All the time, yeah. What's the benefit, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, you're, you're showing me what you're eating. Show me something productive. Yeah. I see kids, and it all goes back to the, the thinking mentality of, of people, you know. I, I, I see kids walk into cousin's room, they're watching KSI. Sorry, this is what we're talking about, misfit boxing, yeah, yeah. right? They've done it brilliantly, yeah, um, where the zone have commissioned that, and they are getting young people to watch a bunch of rubbish. Yeah. That is it, yeah? So I, I sat down with that kid and I said to him, what is this teaching you? So I'll go out to all you people out there as well. If you're sitting down and watching showbiz boxing, what is it teaching you? If you're sitting down watching KSI, Logan, Jake Paul, what are they teaching you? Jack shit. When it comes to business and making money, they're not showing you nothing. They're showing you how successful they are yeah. on the back of you puppets. You know? So... That's really important. You don't want to be put. You know, what do the Chinese do? They own TikTok. You know how the algorithm works, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they show the whole world dancing videos and crap, so that the whole video, uh, the whole world stays dumb. Yeah. But what do they teach their own citizens? Yeah. The algorithm's completely different in China. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. TikTok algorithm's completely different in China. They show them stuff that's pro productive, maths equations, you know, business. Anything that is productive, but to the rest of the world, it's all right. You guys just keep watching. Cringy dances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly that. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the system works. You know, it's like a clever strategy to just dumb the world down yeah, once yeah, yeah. they get smarter. Guys, we just had a little quick break. Uh, we've had a shisha deliver now, so this is the relaxed part of the podcast. <laughs> Going to take a nice and easy, smoke a bit of shisha, and carry on with the podcast. So... Regarding Le Wung, then, how did you build that brand and where is it now? Um, currently, the brand. Yeah. 
uh, we've been over trading now for 19 years because there's never enough stock in the market to supply the demand. So, for example, we did four distributors, 300 plus distributors. We had 600,000 units, but in a week, we did, to be honest, it was less than a week. It was about five days. We sold 800,000. Wow, so units. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always a problem because we don't have enough time to put more articles onto the production line. Uh, w we have different contracts, uh, as I mentioned to you before, different companies that we manufacture also, NATO, military, blah, blah, blah. So we can't take things off production line and put more stuff in because, you know, the de uh, d demand requires it. It's just not enough time. With all your franchises. And peak season well. is Ramadan time as well. So if you think about it now, it's November. Um, and, and all our materials is exclusive. So we do our own materials as well, in-house with diet and everything. So by the time the, the material is ready, you're talking mid-December. And, you know, everything kind of slows down after that, logistically, Christmas, so on and so forth. And how is it like running a factory? You mentioned you opened up a factory in China. Yeah, yeah. just want to talk about that. How, how is it like? Is it quite expensive to run a factory in china then or what was the decision for china no not at all because we have production um we have uh, a certain um clothing that we supply for the domestic market in china as well so whatever money we make for that from that supplies the funding that's required to operate the factory over there and i don't see the profit from that it just operates the uh, factory so covers all the overhead. overheads there was a um there was a factory next door to ours a printing factory uh, because we do a lot of boxes, uh, f uh, fabric, bags, uh, packaging materials. Um, unfortunately, he was, he was having a divorce uh, with his wife. Uh, I mean, I didn't capitalize on it. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But the offer was made. He accepted it. And we bought that factory as well. So wow. we do all the printing in-house. So you've got the second factory as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for our listeners, a lot of our listeners are uh, young entrepreneurs that are starting up in business. Uh, what kind of advice, they're going to be inspired by your podcast and everything that you've achieved, what kind of advice would you give to somebody starting up a brand uh, and looking for suppliers? Because like you said, now we have got Alibaba and AliExpress and, and those others. Do you need to physically go out to China or what's the best way to get manufacturers for your brand? Yeah, uh, I would definitely advise, look, even if you've got someone on Alibaba, and I know it's expensive to go fly out to China, get your visa, very difficult to get visas at times. And um, when you go over there, it's a complete different planet. But you learn a lot. And that's how, that's how you need to progress in business. It's not just about tapping you know, your phone and picking up a supplier because he might send you a container full of turd. You know? And that's happened time and time again. The first container that comes, or LCL or part load container, it comes OK. And then the second one's no good. So you lose money. So it's always better to establish a proper connection with your supplier. And will they entertain? Just say, I'm starting up a new brand now. Uh, I don't really have much finances. I've got five grand or 10 grand or whatever. Can I go there and will they entertain minimum order quantities of 100, 200? Or is that just not heard of? I think they do cater for that now. Um, if they feel that the product that they're going to look at, there was a um a, a certain body i'm not going to name his name uh but again i've helped a lot of people and he had an idea and he was after me for two years um it was to do with uh, a product that johnson's by johnson's were doing it was a uh, a gynecology sheath um that was a surgical equipment for women in hospital disposable item you put the scope for it and you see inside and uh he said he was getting it manufactured in pakistan um I got a factory in China and uh, we had the NHS contracts. Uh, Allah provides in other ways, but what I'm trying to say to you is there are factories out there. If they feel that the product, look, if you go and you, wanna, y you want a bespoke design garment, yeah. different, it's very difficult. But if you've got uh, something that requires a bit of um, civil engineering, then and and they feel like you know what this product hasn't been done before we could patent it and you could do a, probably a jv partnership with the factory over there in china it can work people are willing on doing that with you yeah and the risk of being copied like what people say where 
you start up an idea or you give an idea to a factory and they'll just replicate and before you know it there's 20 factories that are doing it is that possible you've got to have your legalities in order and there are certain ways to protect yourself over there in china as well yeah yeah but it's always good to know someone there i have that link have that link that's interesting i find it fascinating the whole concept of building the brand and having a factory out there as well because mm. you're not just outsourcing and manufacturing you're creating and you own the factory and you own mm. the supply chain from manufacture right through to retail mm. so i find that fascinating so you've built this company mashallah you're really successful you're making millions of pounds how do you then venture into different industries then see it's all about parking your assets so the mentality that i've got is you always spend no more than 10 percent of the income that you have yeah so if uh, if if you're earning a million quid go ahead and spend a hundred thousand pounds yeah but what people do wrong is spend a whole million quid in fact to be honest with you they probably get credit on it and spend 1.5 million pounds that's the biggest issue you know so what i do is i park funds into assets um so i have children i've got five children so what i do is i set up a company and i started parking assets in terms of properties so I started buying one property after the other property after the other property, unencumbered, no mortgages. Um, I don't think I think mortgages are rip off anyway. I don't oh. think uh, people should get into mortgages if they want to climb the property ladder. There's no income in it. Probably have to get about 20 properties just to have a, an average salary. Uh, it's not really worth it. But um, uh, yeah, so I started parking money into assets, and then um, most of the time it was into apartments. Uh, because it was hands off in terms of maintenance but then the service charges have gone up now on them um, the ground rent has been capped um, but um, what I saw was if a person uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you there was a guy called Ray Smith I used to buy properties from is he uh, the Liverpool he, yeah 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 very very successful and um, he lost it all to be honest with you uh, there was a, an episode on Top Gear the first Bugatti Veyron was his car and he took a lot of risk in the property development field and he lost all his money. So there was a, um, a development called Borden Court in Liverpool, okay. right? And I went to see it and this guy was painting himself, right? He lost it all. He had a unique idea, student accommodation with a communal lounge, communal areas, so on and so forth. Never been done before. Anyway, it was a success. So the guy that was selling for him, is, uh, it was a company called Night Knox International. Uh, a guy called Jeremy Knight, very good guy, genuine fella. Uh, he's actually uh, my partner in various different businesses even now. Um, so he was doing um, around two to three hundred million pounds in properties turnover every single month. That's every how many month? Every month. That's how many properties he was selling globally. He was one of the biggest real estate tycoons in, uh, I reckon, in the whole of Europe. Yeah. Wow. Probably, you know, probably touching the rest of the world as well. Um, but there was a winning partnership because um, Ray Smith was doing the developments and then uh, Jeremy Knight, Knight Knox International was selling. Um, and then they went into JV. Uh, they actually helped build the skyline of Manchester as it is today. Salford Keys, uh, the NQ buildings, uh, so on, um, X1 Media City, X1 Exchange, X1 Landmark, you know, big developments. He's yeah. doing Manchester Waters with Peel Holdings. So anyway, I walked into this guy's house and I'm buying properties. And I'm thinking to myself, like, if this guy can do it, why can't I do it? And the only difference is the color of the skin, right? So what I'll do is I'll build a white team around me, you know, or, or my whole team consists of white people. So the city council won't know who I am. You know, I don't need to go into any meetings. You know, even my planning consultant, Gary Neville's uh, firm, they can represent me. So what I did was, um, I sourced a plot of land in Manchester. It took us four years to get planning on it, and we ended up getting planning on that site. I mean, it was the most difficult site to get planning on, purely because of it being truly iconic in terms of its color. Yeah, this is an exciting part of the episode. Uh, when I first uh, read the article and saw it, I was like, wow, to see somebody like yourself uh, build something like that, it inspires me so much, and I'm sure it inspires a lot of our listeners just thinking about that. So. Talk to me about the story on how you get to building a skyscraper. See, it, it's not as difficult as people think it is. Again, yeah. you just got to have a vision. If you have the vision, you can work towards it. And anything is workable. So 
I sat down with the likes of Ray Smith, cut me out completely. Then I sat down with a guy called Elliot Lawless and I used to buy apartments from him as well. Sadly, he went into liquidation. But I said to him, I said, Elliot, screw you, man. We're just having a, a nice, light conversation. I said, screw you, man. I said, he goes, well, what's up, Fez? I said, you're building all these skyscrapers. I'm going to build one myself. <laughs> and he just laughed at me. And then four years later, I showed him the article and he goes, bloody hell, man. He goes, I've never known anyone that, can, that, that said they're going to build a skyscraper and actually get planning. It, it's not as difficult as what people say it is. You've just got to have the right funding. You've got to have the right backbone. Uh, the spine of the company is your team. Yeah, that's what gives you the right advice. Um, and yeah, we're, we're doing another site actually, uh, close by to that one. It was, it's gonna complete next year, quarter one, 2024. I see 11 million pound scheme, 46 apartments. Wow. Um, but yeah, once, once you get planning, you, you, you know, you're a credible developer. Uh, once you've done your first development, you get developers funding. Um, I tend not to go into bank funding because, um, you know, riba interest is haram. Um, so you tend to get private investments. Um, and uh, sometimes it goes right, sometimes it doesn't because private investment uh, investors do want more than what the banks are requesting. And that's why it's a lot more difficult. But if it's halal, we stick to that. So you do create the development it and then you get investors to... Not investors, it'll be a investor. So oh, it'll be someone with, someone with enough liquidity um, that could f uh, fund the construction of the development. So say, for example, it's a 20 million pound scheme. Yeah, yeah. The bill cost is about 11 million pounds. So you get someone that's got the liquidity of 11 million pounds rather than going to uh, developers funding banks, getting conventional funding. Um, we go to someone that's got 11 million pounds and turn around and say, right, okay, we'll give you a return on this. Nine out of 10, they'll turn around and say, actually, I want to keep two floors of the apartment or three f uh, of the uh, of the skyscraper or three floors of the skyscraper. I don't want the return. I'd rather have a passive income. And that's how they take it. And in terms of the profit then, is the le the next nine million profit then if, you, if it costs you 11 million pound to build? N uh, no, no, not necessarily. If it's a 20 million pound scheme, so that means the GDV, the gross development value is 20 million pounds. Yeah. You take your uh, 11 million pound um, away from that because that's your bill plus whatever you're going to give away to the private investor. Yeah. Then it might cost you because you've got to sell it as well. So it might cost you an agency fees five or six or seven percent. So at the end of it, it y you'll make probably three, four, you know, up to probably about six million pounds max. That's how much you do. But your profit's always on your exit. You know, p people tend to think, and that's why I, st I stay away from 300 unit schemes. You know, I've brokered deals. I've brokered deals for Elliot Law. There's 40 million pound schemes, but I've never taken it on board because those figures scare me. Because to sell 200 apartments, 300 apartments, it's a huge task yeah. to begin with, right? But your profit is only in the last 50 apartments. So you've got to sell 250 apartments first and then Break you've broken even, even any 50 apartments is your profit. Wow, is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. And how do you, I'm sure the listeners will love this question, is how do you link in with these guys like Ray from Liverpool, Elliot, who's Elliot? Is he from Liverpool as well? Elliot uh, Lawless is from Liverpool so as well. So how do you link in with these guys? I, look, I, I can, I work with real estate agents as well, yeah? For example, so I'm buying individual residential properties now in the place of Preston, Liverpool, Nelson, Burnley, Accrington, you know, whatever it is, uh, Manchester, you know. Uh, and you could sit with independent real estate agents um, and say, I've got an apartment, or I wanna buy an apartment. But then you can sit with them, turn around and say, right, okay, I, I have a plan. This is what I want to do. I want to buy five properties, but I want to buy it through you. Yeah, but I want you to source the properties for me off market and give me a better deal. Yeah, that's thinking differently. Now, someone else might turn around and say, I want to go to five different estate agents. They won't entertain him as much as me entertaining one estate agent and saying, I'm going to buy predominantly six from you. Yeah, as opposed to going to six different ones and buying one each, you know, it, it, there's no incentive for them. Right, that makes sense. You get me? So what I'm trying to say to you is, if you want growth, right, you've got to find an avenue. Yeah, you've got to find an avenue that motivates you. You know, like right, say, if if you're an estate agent and I turn around very simply and I turn around and say, I'm gonna buy one property from you, can you find me a property? He or she will turn and say. Check on right move. There's plenty of them. And if I do have one come up, it'll be on right move, mate. Yeah. You know? But if I now say to you, right, 
I've got £700,000 and I want to buy six properties from you, right? But only you, find them for me, yeah? But I want it off market and I want it 10% below market, yeah? Or 20% below market. Or I'm thinking of doing them up, I've got a contract in place. That then becomes attractive to you. Okay. Yeah? And at the same time, it becomes attractive to me because there's appreciation at the end of it. So that's what you kind of offer and that's yeah, what you yeah, bring to the table. Yeah, it's, it's all about making an offer that, that's going to suit both parties. And that can work in any business that you do. And for listeners that maybe are starting out in business or don't really have the capital and liquidity like, uh, like you do on the level that you do, can you come in on an entry level and start earning money in property or is it very difficult at the moment? Very difficult. Yeah. Very difficult because you can't get into properties from day one. You've got to make money from different businesses first and yeah. park your asset into properties. Okay. Yeah. That's the, that's the way my mentality is. So uh, very I I in, in basic terms, what I would turn around and say, rather than you spending a million pounds of, say, for example, you've sold uh, a company and you've, and we're talking round figures and you've made a million pound in profit, what are you going to do, right? In this day and age, a lot of people will find a million pound hard to cope with. So what they'll do is they'll end up spending it, silly things, buy a Ferrari and go on holidays, and it's done. That million quid has gone, spent, yeah? But if you say, right, okay, million pounds, I'm going to take 100 grand out, I'm going to treat myself. 900 grand, I'm going to buy 10 properties, but I'm going to buy my 80 grand each. And each one of them is going to give me 12%, 13% income, yeah? You can do it. That's, all, that's now giving you a passive income, yeah. you know? That's the difference. That's the difference between successful, being successful and being a failure. Because once you've rinsed that million quid, you're now starting from square one again. Yeah? But if you've got passive income, you've got income that is disposable. You know? It, you, you can, every month you can spend six grand and turn around and say, don't worry, next month I'll have it come back again. Yeah. That makes sense. That's why people say buy a property and then with the money that comes in, cash flowing every month, buy the cars and the liabilities and whatever else you want. 100%. That's yeah. how you do it. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Okay. So what other businesses have you got then? So you've built up this uh, clothing brand. You've made it a success. 127 franchises, really su su successful, mashallah. You've then got the retail side of things where you're building skyscrapers and uh, making millions through that. What else are you now invested into? I've got various different ventures and businesses set up, but there is something exciting that I did want to talk to you about in relation to helping youngsters start up in new businesses. Yeah. Because we spoke about young people having a drive but not having the funding. Yeah. yeah, we did speak about lazy young people, and yeah, sadly, there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, but those people can't help them. You know, because if you can't help yourself, how, uh, you know, how can you help them? You, know, yep. you can take a horse to water, but you can't force it. So Absolutely. They're, they're, but they're, there are people out there that have got the drive, you know. They've got the drive, they've got the passion, and they are looking up to, you know, the likes of Andrew Tate's and, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos and thinking, right, and Elon Musk, and how can I be that? Yeah. And they're spending all night thinking and, you know, saying, right, I've got this business idea, I've got that business idea, but they haven't got the money. So yep. what to do? So what I'm going to do is, inshallah, starting on social network, um, starting using the network that I've got. If someone's got an idea, um, and it's a good idea, we'll, we'll, what we'll do, we'll put it out on network, yeah? So we'll say, right, pitch is an idea. We get about 100 inquiries coming. Out of the 100 inquiries, I'll pick one or two. So I'll have a team ready that will vet each and every inquiries that come in, or ideas that come in. So we'll pick one or two. We'll have our solicitors in-house that will do all the legalities and we'll uh, be shareholders of that company we'll incorporate the company so we'll say we'll invest with you mr young boy yeah because we like your idea so we'll invest 50 we, we, we'll invest the full money we, we we're, we're 51 percent shareholders of the company but once you provide the monies back within three months six months nine months 12 months we then drop our shareholdings to 20 percent 30 percent whatever it is depending on the business venture we will provide you expertise and we'll provide you the network as well, you know. But you need to promise us one thing, one thing only, and that is hard work. Yeah, hard damn work, yeah, and trust. That's it. 
Mashallah, that's an exclusive to the CEO that's club right there. Exclusive. That's uh, that's the Dragon's Den, but our version. Yeah, yeah. So any entrepreneurs that are listening now that have a business idea that think, you know what, I want to start this business. I've got an idea, but I don't have the savings. I don't have the capital. They can contact you, send you a message. And then if you like the business idea, you will then make that dream a reality. Yes. And the only thing they need to do is be the executors and put in the hard work and effort uh, because it's not easy. You can get the capital, which is one thing, but to build a business like you know, it takes a lot of hard work daily. And it's not like you see on social media, the nice cars and the fancy stuff. It's, it's the boring hard work, the admin, the meeting the clients. It's everything that goes into it behind the scenes that isn't glamorized mm. that they will need to do and put in. So that's a very, very interesting opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I don't think there's any easy way of making easy money. Yeah. And even if there is, yeah, easy come, easy go. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of scammers out there. Yeah. But if you make your money legitimately with hard work, it will last you so much. It will last you a lot longer. You'll have a lot more blessing in it. And not only that, you'll be successful. Yeah. You know, for, for, for many generations, I'm not just talking just you yourself. You'll pass that on because your hard work will then get passed on to your children, to your children, children, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's important. It's a phenomenal idea. Uh, we get a lot of entrepreneurs that message us and have these ideas. So we'll be working quite closely with you, sending you through the right people and mm -hmm. inshallah building that and turning it into a reality. So that's very, very exciting. I'm looking forward to working with you on that project. Uh, so anyone that is listening, uh, send us a message. What does the future hold for you? What does the future hold for me? Ooh. My question is, you've made so much money. You've had so much success. Like what drives you I now? I, I don't think it's the money. Like what drives you? It's a challenge. The challenge. challenge me. Yeah, challenge me. I mean, I, I have a plan. I want to retire by the age of 45. But my wife says, you can't sit on a sun lounger for 10 minutes. Yeah. You'll never retire. Yeah. Because I'm always... I'm always in the field of, it's not, yeah, money is a motivation, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it's a challenge that's better. Yeah. So it's like, tell me you can't do something and I'll prove it. I can. You know, that's my attitude. Yeah. And, and this is what I'm saying, you know, with the youth of today, you tell them they can't do it. They'll sit down in a corner and say, I can't do it because he said I can't do it. Yeah. My attitude is, you told me I can't do it. I'm going to do it better than you, Muppet. Yeah. And I'll show you as well. And then after that, I'm going to bring you as my partner in the company. And yeah. then we're going to work together. That's my attitude. Um, so any challenges out there, I'll be game for. Um, yeah, I have a few projects in the pipeline I need to put a closure on. Okay. And then after that, it's more about spending time with the family because with, with everything that's been going on in the years that I've had children, um, I've not really spent that much time with them. Only in the last maybe four years, I've been spending more time with him. But before that, my eldest son, I haven't spent any time with him uh, when he was young. Um, my 14, 15 year old, I've not spent much time with him as well when he was three, four, five years old, you know. Um, so I reckon uh, to slow down a little bit, yeah. um, but not give up, um, look for other challenges. Um, and then, you know, we, we only live in this world for a very limited time only. So you can't keep chasing the life. You can't keep chasing money. You know, once you've got there and you're content, then, you know, just be comfortable. Be comfortable with yourself. So you mentioned that you didn't spend as much time with your children. Mm. What is your day in the life like? So we do a day in the life of a CEO just to kind of figure out the insights of how different CEOs that we sit down with uh, plan and schedule their day? Are there any habits that they have uh, that help them succeed? So for yourself, just talk me through a typical day in the life of you. Depends uh, on the season, depends um, on the kind of projects that I've got, depends on meetings that I've got on a, uh, on a daily. Some days are back-to-back -back meetings. Um, but if you really want to know the truth, I'm probably up for eight o'clock in the morning okay um i then have a briefing what i've got to do for the day in terms of meetings um site visits um even if it's um you know uh, zoom meetings with our team over there in, in china um i'll probably finish around 
uh, eight o'clock in the evening. Um, in fact, to be honest with you, I've been finishing earlier than that because I'm making both my uh, boys half is at home as well. Wow, so I'll come sure. home for, I'll try to come home. It's not always the case. Come home for about six o'clock. I spend two hours with him. If not, I'll come home for max eight o'clock. Spend two hours. Um, they get to bed at ten. Um, I'll eat late, uh, so ten thirty, eleven o'clock. Um, I'll relax with my wife for a little while, and believe it or not, I'll start work again at two o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock in the morning. I'll start work again at two o'clock in the morning. One or one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. I'll, I'll I'll probably only get to bed for about four or five o'clock. I only have like three hours sleep a day, three four hours at the very most. Three four hours. I sleep. I work on different time zones, you see. So when I've got container. Um, being authorized to be uh, uh, needing authorization to be released from China that's going to Australia I've, I've got to be awake at five o'clock in the morning yeah. you know to make that happen and how are you running the business in terms of all the different countries and the 127 franchises? I've got two assistants um, but no one works as good as you yeah um, uh, three years ago I had adrenal exhaustion I, I completely depleted my body of its nutrients and vitamins so I had forms of hallucinations. I was passing out and I went to, I must have spent thousands going to different consultants. And then a, a friend GP sat down with me and he goes, Fez, there's only one thing you need to slow the hell down. Yeah, just slow down, relax. That's the biggest issue. Yeah, you're not getting enough sleep and your diet's everywhere. So I've cleaned my diet up and the four hours that I get, max four hours of sleep I get, I ensure that it's deep sleep got the eye mask on and stuff, whatever, make sure there's white noise in the background and I have good quality sleep because I've got the watch and it tells me 95% sleep quality is good as opposed to sleeping for seven, eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours and having crap sleep, you know. Um, but I feel fresh. So it, it's not like I feel um, weak or tired or anything like that. Yeah, because I think we had Shaq on the podcast and doesn't sleep for much hours. And uh, yeah, we had a lot of comments. People saying you can't survive on three, four hours sleep. Well, that's impossible. And it was one. Uh, it was a viral video. Of people just arguing about how much sleep you actually need. Uh, you know what's sad though? I'll be messaging, and I, and I do it because then I wake up in the morning and I'll be getting responses on those messages. I'll be messaging even members of staff at three o'clock in the morning, and I'll get the responses at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, people have a tendency of not to not sleeping in this day and age yeah. because they're on the mobile phones. So after work, I'll be working, but people will be going on TikTok, people will be going on Instagram, people will be going on your podcast, and they'll be watching your podcast at one o'clock in the morning, yeah. two o'clock in the morning. That's how people wind down. Yeah, yeah and uh, you know that ruins sleep patterns. Yeah. Keep watching at one o'clock if you are. <laughs> <keep surviving. laughs> but yeah, no, no, I get the point there. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I think I've seen some studies where you shouldn't really be on your phone with the lights off and yeah. after a certain uh, after certain hours it affects loads of different things. Uh, there's a whole science behind it so yeah, I completely get that. As you know, there's uh, uh, what's going on with Palestine right now, really, really sad and unfortunate. Uh, what's going on? What are your thoughts on that? Um, see, there's a lot of influencers out there um, and, and to be honest, I'm going to be fairly frank with people and they've, those people have kind of disgusted me uh, more than anyone else. Influencers such as like, you know, your DJ Khalid and stuff who's Palestinian, but he's not speaking out for Palestinian people. Look, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much you sugarcoat what's going on in Palestine, it is a genocide. Yeah, it's a genocide. I mean, Napoleon was a person that wanted to uh, create a homeland for the Jewish people, right? Obviously, that wasn't successful because of the Ottoman Empire. But when it fell, the British Empire stepped up and they said, right, okay, I think it was in 1917, they created a homeland for the Jewish people, right? They said, the Palestinians, you're going to now allow these Jewish settlers to live in Palestine. There was only 3,000 of them. There was only 3,000 of them, right? And no one can dispute this. That's the thing. No one can dispute this. 3,000 Jewish people came to Palestine. Palestine said, no problem, we'll allow you over here. To England, to Britain, it's not you who decide that because it's not your country, yeah? But it's fine, no problem. 3,000 Jewish people came and settled into Palestine. Now you see what's happening. Those 3,000 grew from year to year to year to year. 1948, Nakba, ethnic cleansing. That's what's happening now. People say it didn't happen. There was no social network then. But now everyone sees it. I just can't take 
people that anything that you say that is pro-Palestinian, you become, it's anti-Semitism. All of a sudden. Why? You know, after killing 10,000 plus innocent people. Uh, I, it just begs the question of what is humanity? Because we've lost it all, haven't we? And do you know what disgusts me even more is what the Arab states are doing about it. Absolute nothing. Yeah? You're talking 22, 23 Arab nations collectively probably own the world's oil, yeah? The richest countries in the entire, you know, uh, in, 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 in planet Earth, right? And they can't give a glass of water into Gaza, you know? You're talking about humanitarian aid. It's not an argue, it's not a discussion. I don't even know what United Nations do. They sit down and discuss for hours and hours. But what, what happens at the end of that discussion? Another thousand you know, innocent lives are killed in, in Palestine. Tomorrow's another discussion. Discussions just keep going on. I mean, it's blindsiding us all into seeing what's actually happening in Palestine. No one can argue it. No decent human being can argue it. In fact, I think you find more of the wider community as opposed to the Muslim community that oppose what's going on in Palestine. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts then in terms of the defense that, you know, there was an attack, so we're going to kill all these people? Like what your, what's your thoughts on the defense that, because all the interviews I see, they there's Morgan and all the rest, the first thing is, do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Yeah. That's, that's was always the case. Let's say Hamas did what they did. M you know, we condone Hamas. Of course we do, yeah? N you know, no one likes innocent uh, human beings being killed. We don't like Hamas for what they're doing or what they've done. You know, we condone that. We condone any form of terrorism. But let's ask Pierce Morgan this question, then, yeah? Let's turn around and say, okay, Pierce Morgan, your son just committed murder. Yeah, he just killed someone in school, right? And now all your family is going to be executed. What's, what's his response going to be? Well, hang on a minute. Why are you executing all of my family for what my son's done? Well, that's what you're doing with the Palestinian people. Uh, hang on, Pierce Morgan. Yeah, because his question that he always will, what is the right proportion? Okay, no problem, Pierce Morgan. You choose from which one of your children gets to die. Yeah. Yeah? Choose the right proportion. We're talking about proportions when it comes to innocent human beings. It's disgusting. How can you say, all right, this girl... Uh, uh, um, you know, deserves to live and this girl deserves to die. It shouldn't even be a conversation. Okay, for example, um, Osama bin Laden, yeah, America were after him for quite a lengthy period of time. What did they do? Bomb the whole of Pakistan? Yeah, they went after him strategically, right? So why aren't they doing that with this? There is international law which specifically says you can't do certain things. You can't go and indiscriminately blow up schools, blow up mosques, churches, that those laws are in place, so why is it some people can break those laws and get away with it, and other people do half as much in the the world, the world's worst people? And the sad thing is, this is me and you are powerless. What can we do? We can donate, we can do make dua, and that's the only thing we can do. And even when we donate, we don't even know where the money's going. What we do rely on is the Arab states. What are they doing? You know, what what. What did the Ottoman Empire teach us? Unity. Yeah, Muslims coming together. That's why they were so powerful for hundreds of years, yeah? Why was the Sahabas and Prophets, why were they so successful, yeah? Like even the story of Alif Lam in Ghulibati Rum, Rome will be defeated, yeah? When the Sahabas sat there and the revelations coming in, they're thinking to themselves, what do you mean Rome will be defeated, right? We're living in Sudan and Sudan, for example, is going to conquer the United States of America. How is that possible? But it's unity that makes that happen. Muslims don't have unity. Arab states don't have unity. The uh, foreign minister of Saudi Arabia will stand up and make, do you know what? Let me, let me put it this way to you, right? Saudi Arabia uh, held a boxing event. Yeah. Right. Tyson Fury and um, what's his name? Francis. Yeah. Yeah. They fought. They fought on the day that Gazans were being killed innocently. If they had any heart, they would turn around and say, we're going to postpone this event because of all the calamities that have ha happened in Palestine today. In fact, they had an opening ceremony, yeah? And after that, they, had a, they were going to do another concert. I don't know whether it went forward, uh, but they were going to do the first ever Shakira concert the weekend after. You know, why is this happening? We've got to ask ourselves, what kind of Muslims are we? You know, you, you can stand up and be the imam in a haramain, yeah? 
yeah, and, and make dua, yeah? But actions, innit? That's what counts for something. Like, you're, you're saying something, but you're doing nothing. Yeah. That's a hypocrite. That's worse than the munafiks at the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You yeah. know, it's worse. It doesn't make any sense. And even with the UK, on the one hand, they're donating to Palestine and, and sort of giving a little bit of aid, but then on the other end, they're giving all the weapons and all the, the rest of it, sending those shipments as well. So it's like, does it make any sense? It yeah, it's, it's like the protest today, they were against it. Rishi Sunak was against it, you know. And uh, the, 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 the protest today was about saving innocent lives, yeah. But however, it, because it was Remembrance Day, they were saying that it's an insult. How is it an insult? Yeah. Say, for example, that person that died in war, right? He's going to be happy that you do su such a protest or a march because you're now saving people that are still living. Yeah. As opposed to not doing the protest, right? And thinking about people that are dead. Don't make any sense. They've twisted it and, and said that it's hate marches. I've seen that on the news. Yeah, like yeah. When they're not really hate marches, yeah. they're just asking for... Half a million people, 6,000... Uh, half a million people, about six people got arrested. Yeah. You're telling me that's a hate march? It doesn't make any sense at all. But it's scary how powerful the media is and how they can gaslight and twist and make the vi victims look like enemies and the enemies look like victims. It's crazy that how powerful the social media that is. That's why China... It's, I reckon it's a superpower anyway. Um, but that's why China is China. And I'll tell you the reason why. is because they didn't buy into Google. They've got their own Baidu. Yeah. Kay. They didn't buy into WhatsApp. Yeah. They've got their own WeChat. They control their own social network platforms. So they're not dictated by United States and UK. And they did that deliberately because they didn't want their servers in San... Uh, they didn't want data, Chinese data, in San Francisco. So they played it really clever. They don't even have Uber over there. They've got their own. They don't need it. They don't need the rest of the world. But they were in lockdown for four years. They only come out of lockdown last year, I think it was. Yeah, yeah they only came out of lockdown last year. So th they're self-sustainable. This is what the Arab states need to learn from. Yeah. Forget about that US dollar. Get pegged with the Chinese yen. I think they probably think that if they do, they're just going to get blown to base, like kind of uh, because of the power that certain countries have. Where's the Iman then? There is no Iman, <laughs> yeah. It's Where's the Iman then? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, uh, there's a very famous hadith there. Al mu'minuna karulu jin wahidin in ishtaka aynu ishtaka kulluhu. If a human being, if there's pain in your eyes, it affects the whole body. If there's pain in your head, it affects the whole body, right? So if there's pain in Palestine, it should affect the whole Muslim ummah. Yeah? So why are these guys sitting down, uh, never mind, never mind relaxingly, yeah, and not doing anything about it. They are doing their own form of entertainment. So that's what I find bad. You know, that's what I find bad. Because they're rubbing salt in the wound. You know, they, they're saying to that Palestinian father who's seen his wife being blown to bits, including, you know, their children, I don't give a shit about you. Yeah, I'm still going to be dancing and singing. I'm still going to do my entertainment. I'm still going to have my nasha, and I don't care about you. What kind of Muslims are we? We're being tested. You know, honestly, we're, we're being tested. I think overall, business-wise, everything, if you put it all together, it just makes sense. You know, when we spoke about trust, yeah. it all comes together. It all comes about how good are you as a Muslim. Yeah, it definitely feels like it's uh, close to the Day of Judgment. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's what people say. Look, regardless of wars, all we're saying is there's innocent people out there, innocent elderly, women, children, babies, you know, uh, teenagers. I've got the whole world, the whole life to look forward to. Those people are being killed. So all we're saying is protect these people, yeah? protect these people, because that's all that matters. Wars are wars, but there shouldn't be collateral damage when it comes to innocent lives. So let's stop the killing. Regardless of what's happening in the world, let's just stop the killing. Let's put a stop to um, what's happening uh, uh, in, in ev it doesn't even need to be in certain specific country. In anywhere, anywhere where there's killing, stop, have a ceasefire and have diplomatic discussions. So 
we'll, uh, we've got a few questions from the listeners. Uh, I always uh, mention which guests I'm going to get on next, and then they fire loads of questions at us. So I'm just going to fire some at you now, and that's how we're going to conclude the podcast. So one of them is uh, you've started off uh, in humble beginnings. Uh, you've experienced the challenges, and now you've, uh, mashallah, built uh, a successful companies. You've made millions. So you've seen both sides of the spectrum. So the question is, does money buy you happiness or does it change your life? No, um, money, you know, when, you know when people turn around and say money doesn't buy you happiness? Yeah. Those people don't have money. <laughs> yeah. No, no, honestly, it's simple. Yeah. Those people don't have money. That's why they're saying it, because it makes them feel better. Of course, money buys you happiness. You know, if you don't have, if, you, if you're going to buy a Ferrari, it buys you happiness. Yeah, if you're going to go on a holiday, it buys you happiness, doesn't it? Yeah, but I think at the same time, what's really important is who you're sharing the money with. Yeah, if you're a bachelor and you're single and you've only got friends, yeah, I reckon that's very limited. Yeah, that's very limited. So even if you've got all the money in the world, there's only so much you're going to gain from that. But if you've got a loved one, if you've got a wife, you can share, you know, because there's a lot of unconditional emotions out there, right? So if you can share the happiness, that becomes an, it's on a completely different level then. And then when you have children, and then you go on multiple holidays and you show them the world. I'll give you an example, right? My uh, daughter, you know, um, uh, last Christmas, uh, I think it was on the 23rd of December, um, I was looking outside of this grim, it's horrible in the UK. You know, people just uh, falsely pretending to, to be happy, yeah. you know, and now looking forward to the, the new year. Uh, not like they've done anything this year, right? <laughs> and you're looking outside and you're thinking, bloody hell, it's freezing and whatever. This is what financial freedom buys you, right? So I'm looking outside, I'm thinking, right, my little one always wanted to go to Disneyland. So I'm going to book Disneyland. So on Christmas Eve, I booked Disneyland. On Christmas Day, my wife woke up and I said, pack your bags, we're going to Disneyland. That's what I did, yeah? And it was... Uh, it was the happiest moment for the little ones. Yeah. They enjoyed themselves. So obviously it's buying you happiness. Of course it is. But if you've got no one to share it with, that's the sadness, isn't it? You yeah. know, if you've got all the money in the world and you haven't got a supportive wife. Uh, and I've seen it, you know, with people that have got millions. Right? So they do have uh, uh, wives at home, but it'll be divorce after divorce after divorce because everyone's a gold digger. Yeah. You know, they've not got someone that they've grown uh, wealthy with. You know, that's a winning product over there. And mashallah, you have grown with your wife. She started yeah. off with you at the beginning whilst you were growing the business yeah, yeah. and sti uh, stuck with you the whole way through. So for people that maybe uh, find that people treat them differently, in your case, have you found that now that you've made millions, people start to see you differently, treat you differently, talk to you differently? Of course, there's, uh, there's people out there that never used to, you know, bat an eyelid uh, when they saw me. And now when you drive a nice car, yeah. you know, there was times where you used to drive. In, in fact, it's not you can't you can never win, right? You you don't say salam to a person on the road and they find you arrogant, yeah. But when you drive a nice car and you say salam to that same person, he says you're showing off. <laughs> you can't win, honestly, yeah. yeah. And then you you'll find people that never used to bat an eyelid, and all of a sudden they want to have meetings with you because you've got money. You know you've got money, but I I, I think I think the, the most successful. I've had, yeah, is being a father and being a good husband, yeah, personally, because if I was single and I didn't have anyone to share that with, it, all this would be, would be pretty useless, you know, it wouldn't buy me any happiness. So it's the relationships, the experiences, that's what you... Unconditional love, you can't buy it. Yeah. You can't buy unconditional love. Yeah, mashallah. And for your life at the moment... What kind of things do you enjoy, you as a person, away from the business? What, what kind of things do you I enjoy? Know, I like shopping, I'm not going to lie. Because yeah, obviously yeah. there, was, there was times where you used to go outside and, you know, and you can't afford shit. Yeah, yeah, but now you've got... It, you know, funny, because my wife, she still goes and she doesn't like going to like Dior's and Gucci's and Louis Vuitton's and stuff. Now, I'll buy her, you know, handbags and stuff, but she prefers the Primarchs. Wow. Honestly, sure. she does. Yeah, she prefers the Primarchs. She's like... It doesn't suit me as a person, yeah. you know. I'm a mother. Uh, okay, when we go out for a meal together as a couple, then she'll probably wear it, and I'll take the piss. I'm like, oh, look at that one. You put it that. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, and I do like my cars. Um, so I'm not going to lie. Um, what kind of cars do you have? Um, Hurricane, Urus, and um, uh, Vantage. 
Uh, Avant- 488 GTB Spider, yeah. Advantage is beautiful. McLaren. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you've got a fair few cars. Which yeah, one's yeah. your favourite? Um, I don't know. D- different personalities in different cars. Okay. Difficult to tell, really. So if you had to pick one right now that you could drive, is it? Comfort. I'd go for comfort all day long. Okay. What's the most comfortable? Bentley Continental GT. That's the most comfortable? Yeah, yeah. I find it comfortable. I like it better than the S-Class as well. Wow. Because it, it's just... you got luxury. Uh, you got the looks. you got the power. It's beautiful. Yeah. And the Aston Martin that you came in today is, is beautiful. The Vantage. The Vantage. That is beautiful. That's my I kind I of... I, I I bought, I, my wife loves James Bond movies. Yeah, yeah I don't know James why. Bond yeah, she likes watching James Bond. <laughs> yeah. So we went to watch James Bond. And then... Uh, I said to her, I said, uh, I'm going to show you who the real James Bond is. <laughs> and then a week after, I went to Newcastle, Aston Martin, and I said to him, I said, I want the James Bond car. And they did the whole James Bond theme, they did the whole, re- um, you know, the revealing, and they said, um, uh, Mr. Bond on the envelope and stuff. No way. Yeah, yeah. Then I drove it back. What was and the I reaction? I told my missus, I said, come on. <laughs> who was the reaction? <laughs> oh, she loved it. <laughs> she said, you're a joker. Yeah. Wow, mashallah, that's... that's I'm a big kid, man. That's powerful. So so you like your cars, you like your fast cars. I've seen the number plates as well. You've got some really nice number plates. I think you've got a monopoly over the uh, the number plates. Some which ones have you got? Is it the uh, the FAs? So you've got a monopoly over the FAs. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a few of them. I've got the FAs, whatever, the 61, 91, one FA, you know, 66 FA, whatever. All the FAs. I try to buy all the FAs. Yeah. Because I, I I find you know Asians, we have a tendency to uh, get number plates that replicate the name. Yeah. I just find that a little bit cringe, man. Uh, sorry name. if you've got one. I yeah. don't know if you have. <laughs> yeah, I've got have you? CEO Asif. <laughs> I know that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's branding, okay. Like, I, uh, I used to see it a lot in Bolton. Yeah. Because uh, Ucha is it's a big family yeah. and everyone's getting like a different Ucha number plates. I'm just finding it a bit cringe. I'm like, yeah. you know, go for quality. Like yeah. something that looks good and it looks appealing. I know Bradford's <laughs> full of them. Full of number plates. Yeah, yeah. full of like Mahmoud's and Saeed's and Dawood's yeah. and whatever. But I just go for the you know the unique because they appreciate in value as well. Yeah, it's all about value. You got to have some big uh, capital to be able to buy the two letter number plates and like yeah, those yeah. three four letter number plates. The price increases quite a lot, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I've yeah. I've got yeah. Masoud's as well. <laughs> as, uh, as family, yeah. <laughs> but that's sentimental value. Okay, we can yeah. we can let that one slide. Uh, so you like your number plates? You like your cars? Anything else? What kind of traveling? And I like my horses as well. I got saw four, horses, yeah. Four mares and a stallion at the moment in time, but I love my horses. Horses. Are you like ride them. horses? Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to watch uh, Ertugrul. Oh, and is then, that where uh, you came from? And then I thought to myself, yeah, do you know what? I kind of fancy getting on a horse. And when I got on a horse, it's bloody hard work. Yeah, can yeah, you it's so hard. It, 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 it's all on your thighs, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, I, I like to go to dressage, you know, like uh, competitions and stuff like that. There's one guy that um, bought one to my stable. He bought it for 400, 400 grand for a horse. But do you know what? If anything goes wrong with that horse, I, I had a time where uh, the stallion got let out and um, it, it went into the fields and um, it chased the mares. And one of them got its leg knocked uh, because standings are standings. You yeah. know, once they once they're out, uh, you know, there's if it's season, there's nothing stopping them. Um, wow. But once w- there's there's nothing recovering from a broken horse's leg, you can't recover from it. Oh, we can't even recover. No, no, no. So what does it? You got to put it down. Oh wow. That's what I'm saying. So if anything happens, if you happens, put that much money into it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow, exactly. that's good. So you keep them at your stable. Have you got stables? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and where do you s- do you spend the majority of your time in the UK, or are you out and about in different countries? The, the, the idea is, and and again, this is thinking long term. Um, I think you've probably gathered that from the podcast now. But the idea is just to move somewhere else in the Middle East, whether it be Qatar, whether it be Dubai. I don't really like Dubai, but I like Dubai as a country, brilliant country and stuff. But I'm s- thinking about myself, my own sanity, because if I go there, there's too much competition, yeah. and I want to be ahead of the competition. So I'm like, okay, so what do you do? Like, okay, you've got this. Like, okay, I can do that as well. I can do that as well. I can do that as well. And everyone's a hustler over there because you've got no choice but to make money. Yeah. And I think that's really important for the younger generation. I've always endorsed people that I know um, who are 18, 19, 20-year-olds who, who, who work at British Gas or who's doing call centers. If they've got a little bit of savings, go to Dubai and set up over there and the opportunity will come. And 99.9% they've all been successful having moved out over there. So you'd recommend the move out? To I, I, I want to do that for my own self as well. Because look, the thing is, if I've got, it's how much money do you actually need? Really, think about it, yeah? So if you've got, 
I don't know. I'm boring someone over there. No, but no, if no, you've no. got, <laughs> no, 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 you're good. No, no, no. But if you've got a passive income of, um, I, I don't know, two hundred grand. Yeah. I'm I'm talking like little money over here. Yeah. But if you've got two hundred grand, we're not even talking millions. Yeah. If you're talking two hundred thousand pounds, yeah, passive income. So disposable income, and I want to make it realistic because, you know, there's you you probably got subscribers out there and thinking, this guy's got you know talking millions and stuff. I'm talking two hundred grand. Yeah, uh, that's Passive probably income. still. <laughs> oh, <okay>. That's <laughs> probably <laughs> wait, wait, one second. Right. That, that's that's probably uh, still unattainable for some people. Maybe they might have twenty grand or even uh, two grand. <laughs> you know, these this day and age, a lot of people don't even have savings. You know, right, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. It's crazy. But yeah, let's just say, <laughs> let's just divide that by about ten. Just say twenty grand. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> like he's looking at me like no, fuck it, I, change. No, 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 I'm thinking like, look, it, it's you know people always tend to. I, I've sat in board meetings where there's there's been people there that are billionaires. Yeah, but at the ages, I've sat with someone that's 67 years old, and I've, I've sat with Don King, you know, and he won't walk unless he's getting paid ten thousand dollars for every step he takes. Wow, you know, and he's practically on his deathbed. Right, so you've got to think to yourself: A, with iman, you get contentment. Yeah, you have to have contentment because if you've not got contentment, money is nothing but a number, right? And the second thing is, if you've got money, right, then find happiness in something else. Uh, come to the fact that okay, there's a lot of people out there, multimillionaires. If you've got two hundred grand, just two hundred grand, right, and you're living up in Dubai, Middle East. School tuition fees, wherever you got six, seven kids, talking 70 grand. Yeah, a maids 10 grand, chefs 10 grand, you know, drivers 10 grand, talking 100 grand gone. Yeah, yeah? you still got 100 grand spare, right? You can go on eight, nine holidays. So, really, do you need to go out and make multi millions? Uh, you know, or can you actually survive a lavish lifestyle on 100, 200 grand? You can, it's easily done. It's how you invest your time and money. Yeah, I think I watched a really interesting video from 50 Cent where he was talking about whether you have 10 million or whether you have a million or even 100,000, you can still have the same quality of happiness because you can live in a council house and be happy or you can have a 10 million pound house and be unhappy. It's your mindset and your own inner happiness of, of trying to be happy and what you're happy with as opposed to uh, what you actually have. So it kind of relates to that a little bit. Uh, so I find that quite fascinating. Uh, but for yourself, uh, a lot of our listeners are wanting to start businesses, are entrepreneurs, are watching this podcast because they have a passion for business. So what kind of advice could you give them? I think there's been some good themes that have come out of this podcast. I can tell that you're hardworking. Uh, I can tell that you're somebody that is a go-getter, that's proactive and goes out and does things. I can also tell that you've got those old school values that you mentioned early on in the podcast trusting, uh, you know, the handshake and being able to have that word of mouth kind of bond, which is very rare these days. So it's so good to see. Mm. Uh, so from somebody like yourself, what kind of advice could you give to somebody that's wanting to start up a business and be successful? Maybe they're failing. Maybe they don't have the insights that you have and they've experienced a few, you know, failures and they're feeling a little bit negative because a lot of people fail once, fail twice, and then automatically it clouds their their, their personalities and abilities to see beyond. Yeah, you just answered your own question though, because you said everything that I've said. Yeah. So if they've got all those elements and they work on it, success, look, uh, we, we have this uh, in, in boarding school, we always learn that Allah will never take your hard work in vain. You'll always be rewarded. So as long as you've got all those elements that you mentioned, you will be rewarded. But look, and, and again, I'm, you know, I, I, you need to bring faith into it, yeah? There's people out there, and I know of famous people out there as well, that turn and say, uh, they've had a conversation with me first. Things are always going bad for me. I've always, I've lost this contract. I've got lost that contract. And, you know, I've always, you know, been shafted left, right, and center. You know, as something that seems promising has never delivered. And my response, and some of them are new Muslims, and I, my response is, look, how long did Nuh alayhi salam pray for his son? Yeah. How long was uh, did certain uh, prophets uh, live for, and how many years did they pray for? Yeah. Probably three or four times more than what you're going to survive on planet Earth. Yeah. But they were rewarded after all of that. 
So who are we to question? You know, who are we to question? Because we've done one dua and we've tried a few things and it's not gone right. We're now crying about it. Get up, man. Be a man. Do something. Do it again. Do it again and again and it'll pay off. MashaAllah, that's powerful, powerful words. So you've, you've mentioned a few of these uh, during this podcast yeah. and uh, I really like the deeper meaning behind them. So to end the podcast, I think it'll be nice uh, to end, uh, end the podcast on one. So is there anything that comes to mind at all? Look, Allah will test us all the time, constantly, consistently, because He favors you. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladina amunista'inu bi sabri wa salat. Just stay stad- steadfast on your salah and have sabr. Allah will test you. Wala nabluwannakum bi shay'in minal khawfi wal ju'i wa naqsin minal amwali wal anfusi wa thamarat. With certain different aspects, with, um, you know, with poverty, uh, with death in the family, so on and so forth. Wa bashiri sabirin. That's the final thing. But happiness is with the person who has sabr. If he has sabr and he continues to strive for success, he'll have it. Wallahu khayru razakin. Allah is the best of providers. Wow, that's a very, very powerful way to end the podcast, mashallah. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out. We've taken up uh, quite a lot of your Saturday. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not easy to get somebody like yourself on the podcast. Like you mentioned before, it's an exclusive. You've never been on a podcast before, so I really appreciate you sitting down, taking the time out on a Saturday uh, afternoon, now going towards the evening, two, three hours of your time you've taken out. So I really appreciate you coming onto the platform. Uh, I've learned a lot myself, and I think going forward, I'm definitely going to be picking your brains uh, on and off camera, to be fair, because uh, you're in the similar industry to ourselves, and uh, I feel like there's a lot that not only myself, but all our listeners can learn from you. Keep smashing it. Mashallah, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be inspired by your story. Uh, if anyone does want to contact you or try and reach out to you, is there a way that they can potentially get um, to you? Uh, probably through Instagram. Now, yeah. I, I would apologize if there's a delay in response because I've got a lot of things to do. Yeah. Um, but I will definitely respond to anyone that sends any inquiries for you, even for yourself, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. send us a message. We'll try and link you in. Uh, it's been a really inspirational podcast guys if you like this podcast and you want us to get exclusive guests like we have been doing back to back just like comment subscribe share this podcast show the love and we'll continue to bring on entrepreneurial tycoons uh, like yourself onto the platform inshallah Jazakallah for giving me the opportunity as well thank you very much Mm.